Okay, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is July 22nd, 2021. It's 10 a.m. and I'm calling the meeting to order. I have a few administrative details. Um, our executive director, Bren Hare, officially started this week and she's joining us today. Um, we're very fortunate to have her. Um, thank you for joining. Happy to uh, be here. Our full advisory committee has been named at this point. Um, we posted the list to our website. Uh, I think it's under our, um, where, we, where we post our meeting uh, minutes and agendas. For now, we'll put it in a more prominent spot uh, when we have some time. Um, we are negotiating our final contracts with our two consultants currently. Uh, once that's finished, our plan is to form subcommittees of our advisory group and with their help, really shift our focus, um, the board's focus, to drafting our October and November recommendations for the legislature. And in the meantime, um, we're gonna be finishing out our uh, thematic meetings dedicated to the specific priorities um, established in Act 164 and Act 62. Uh, this, week, this week, we're looking at the hemp program um, including some of the uh, concerns around product manufacturing and testing um, and to really see what sort of lessons we can carry forward into the adult use market. Next Thursday, um, we'll be having another meeting um, most likely dedicated to public safety issues including highway safety and safe banking. Um, we'll post an agenda uh, once that's finalized, hopefully early next week. Uh, and then finally, last announcement, Kyle and Bryn will be attending a meet and greet event. Um, it's gonna be at uh, 1425 North 116 in Bristol tomorrow from four to 6 p.m. So uh, the event's free and open to the public. So please feel free to go out and meet Kyle and Bryn in person. Uh, turning to the agenda, um, Again, uh, we're gonna be looking at the hemp program today with Stephanie Smith, um, the head of the Cannabis Quality Control Program, and hopefully Carrie Jaguer uh, will join us. Um, he's the Director of Public Health at the Agency of Agriculture. Um, just from some of you know the board's initial conversations with Carrie and Stephanie, it's clear that the Cannabis Quality Control Program has a lot to offer us, um, has a lot of expertise that they've built up over the past few years. Um, so we thought it'd be a good idea to really dig in today to see what we can carry forward to the high THC adult use program. Um, we also have some great witnesses from fire safety um, that helped develop certain aspects of the hemp program um, and you know has some thoughts for us about best practices um, for product manufacturing. Um, we'll also be hearing from BIA Diagnostics um, and Crea Botanicals about some of the challenges and opportunities um, in the fields of testing and product manufacturing and ex extraction. Um, so before we get to Stephanie and Carrie, has everyone had an opportunity to review the draft minutes from 715? Yep. Yep. Okay, I will I take a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move to approve the minutes from 715. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, um, well, let's just jump right in then. Um, Stephanie, are you ready to get going? I am ready to get going. Awesome. Um, and for everyone at home, I'm just off screen. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and hopefully you all can hear me. Uh, I made you a presenter, so you should Yeah, I, share. so I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, and I will begin from the beginning. Um, so we're going to talk about the hemp program a little bit. Um, and I, my name is Stephanie Smith for the record. I work for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, uh, Food and Markets, and I manage the hemp program. Um, and a part of that is the Cannabis Quality Control Program. I'm here at the agency. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I've been with the agency for almost eight years. Um, I came to the agency to initially work on um, farmland conservation, manage the Act 250 um, primary agricultural soils um, review process related to Act 250, uh, Section 248, uh, and um, also made variance determinations and um, farming determinations for those individuals that were building structures, 
uh, in on their farms and whether or not they needed to go through the municipal land use uh, review process for the construction of those buildings. Um, and so that's when I came to the agency and then I transitioned to hemp. Um, um, prior actually to coming to the agency, I worked at the Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, for many years and then also uh, within the Municipal Assistance Center, uh, and then I also worked as a planner and a zoning administrator for the City of Montpelier and for the City of South Burlington. So I have a fair bit of experience um, in land use. At one time, I was a, a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners, but I've let that lapse because um, I no longer really do that anymore. Uh, so anyway, uh, moving on to the presentation. Let's see here. Um, I have a small overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm first going to provide some hemp program statistics so you have an understanding of like the number of registrations, um, uh, not necessarily our growth over time, but maybe a little bit of our uh, uh, contraction over time within the hemp program. Um, I'm going to talk about the hemp program authorization, including the cannabis quality control program, and then other programs within the agency of agriculture um, that help support the uh, cultivation of hemp um, and processing of hemp within the state of Vermont. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the definition of farming, um, which was initially um, introduced by uh, Ryan Patch last week. Um, so I'll spend a little bit more time talking about that. Um, so for some t statistics, um, these are some maps from 2019 and 2020 regarding um, cultivation of hemp in the state of Vermont. Um, the, just to point out, the um, legends for each of these are a little different because over between 2019 and 2020, um, the program contracted. And so the dark green represented in the 2020 map is 300 or more acres. The dark green in the 2019 map is greater than 900 acres. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we're not comparing apples to apples in this image. Um, but in 2019, the agency registered approximately 1,300 individuals, um, and we had over 9,000 acres registered for cultivation. We do not know um, specifically how many acres were actually planted in that year, um, and the cost to register in that year was $25, regardless of the size of your operation. And so in many instances where people were unclear or uncertain as to where they were going to grow, they could still register multiple acres for $25, and then at least they were covered if they relocated their plot of land. Um, so probably the reason for the 9,000 acres. Uh, and however, there's still 1,300 registrants. Um, in 2020, we issued 590 registrations with about 1,600 acres registered. In 2021, we're at 417 um, registrations issued. 347 of those are for growing. Um, 78 of those 347 are for personal use cultivation. 62% of our registrants um, are growing less than a half an acre of all of our grower registrants. We have about six um, that are exclusively growing for grain or fiber um, and 775 acres um, under cult or that are registered with us. Um, the from 2019, I mentioned that the fees were $25 per registration. Currently, it's a, it's a scaled registration fee, $25 for personal use registration. That still exists. Um, but the cost um, for indoor is different if you're cultivating. I think it's $1,000 or $3,000. And this is my recollection. I apologize. I didn't write up all the costs. Um, but then it ranges for a hundred, between a hundred and I think $3,000 for outdoor cultivation. Um, and the, the highest amount is greater than 50 acres. Uh, and then I also wanted to mention that about 99% of our registrants are growing for floral material and for the production of cannabinoids. So the hemp program is generally, you know, kind of um, begins with um, the USDA's domestic hemp production program. So in 2018, there was a, in 2014, there was a farm bill that passed um, that enabled uh, states to uh, institute pilot programs um, to, for the cultivation of hemp. Um, Vermont, you know, right off the mark, uh, started registering individuals within their pilot program. Um, and then in 2019, the federal government um, took hemp off the controlled substances list um, and then asked USDA to develop rules governing the cultivation of hemp. 
Um, this is specifically, USDA's domestic hemp production program is specifically addressing the cultivation of the crop. It does not address the processing of products. Um, in Vermont, um, and so th just some distinctions here, <laughs> um, hemp is considered an agricultural commodity. Hemp is legal to ship across state boundaries um, and be traded in commerce. Um, you can use the U.S. Postal Service to ship hemp. Uh, they have guidance on their website, um, and then by 2023, any laboratory that is testing for the purposes of compliance or testing hemp must be registered with the uh, um, DEA. So those are kind of some boundaries that are, there are other things that USDA requires within a um, domestic hemp production program, but I thought that these were some things that obviously are very different <laughs> from cannabis. <laughs> so I wanted to highlight them. In Vermont, we have a broad authority um, to regulate hemp um, broader than what is authorized by the federal government. Um, we, or what that is included within the U.S., um, uh, the domestic hemp um, program, production program. In Vermont, we have the ability to not only regulate growing and we have the ability to regulate processing. We have the ability to regulate or set standards for testing and um, to develop a marketing program for industrial hemp. And that is a little bit beyond what USDA is looking at. Um, it was interesting when I was asked to come today, I went back and through our um, old um, presentations that we made uh, when we were beginning the development of our rules and I came across two slides that I'm going to share. And the things that kept coming up from the industry um, through this process was uh, there's a lack of a common vocabulary amongst folks in the hemp industry. Like what are we talking about when we say distillate? What are we talking about when we say um, full spectrum. Um, and these are terms that you may be using in the cannabis program. And so we attempted within the hemp um, program to establish a common vocabulary. Um, we didn't know very much about the industry and the potential growth in Vermont. And what, besides just the cultivation and the processing, what other industries would feed into the cultivation of hemp and how would those markets expand? Um, so this is specifically hemp related, but um, to what extent will individuals in the state of Vermont be interested in breeding hemp varieties um, for production within our state? Um, and how often will we ship from out of state? Um, so, so these were these are unknowns. Um, and then, uh, and we actually don't even we currently don't track the number of folks that are breeding hemp um, uh, seeds in our state. We do have there is a requirement. Well, I'm, not, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to stay on the slide. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we needed to establish uh, contaminant limits for the um, consumption of hemp. Um, so we've done that. Uh, we needed to explore how other um, agencies uh, can support the hemp industry. And then what does the Vermont brand look like? And so these questions you'll see, they're, they're mostly kind of looking at a consumer protection angle. They're not specifically related to the cultivation, the agronomics of hemp. <laughs> They're not specifically related to, um, I mean, they are related to potency, um, but it is a much broader um, conversation um, than I think what is, what USDA is looking at from their perspective. Um, and so we saw that there are many opportunities, um, collection of data, defining Vermont's brand, um, and then to look at what existing programs within the agency and even in, within state government we could use to support the development of the industry in the state. Um, and again, you did hear last week from um, Ryan Patch, uh, TJ Poor, and Barry Murphy with um, the Department of Public Service. Uh, and um, Billy Coster, and they all talked about the programs that they administer um, that can feed into, they feed into hemp, most definitely in some instances. Um, and then later today, you're going to hear from fire safety as well, <laughs> which we've developed a close relationship with. Um, but these are other regulatory regimes and programs within the state of Vermont that lend support to the hemp industry specifically and certainly um, will likely be involved in, in um, what you are all attempting to accomplish. Um, so specifically the hemp program, we do register um, growers and processors. We approve certifications for laboratories. Um, we determine when testing is necessary within that value chain. Um, so in an effort to provide opportunities for those that are growing and processing hemp, uh, in the state, there are different points within the movement of the crop through to a finished product that we are requiring 
um, testing or results that can serve as proof of compliance with our rules. We don't always require the same test at every stage, um, but we require proof of a test having been conducted in order to serve as compliance. And this is generally because the, the, the folks that are going to have conversations with their growers and or their processors or their white labelers or whatever, um, we just want to make sure that there's a test result there, but we let the industry or the market determine who's going to pay for that test and when that test will happen. Um, but people need to be in control of those records as it moves through to the end product. Um, we also obviously conduct inspection and enforce our rules. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out is the difference between the hemp program and the um, or hemp and cannabis or program specifically is that uh, we register growers and processors. Um, we do not have any registrations or licenses for retailers. We don't have any registrations or licenses for wholesalers. Um, your, the wholesale definition, I have it here, um, is pretty broad, actually. Um, we, we do have terms of art um, for aggregating and or brokering hemp, or terms that we use within our program. And those individuals we consider our processors, um, I think for simplicity's sake. Um, within the hemp program. So if you're going to aggregate hemp and then sell it to another individual, you have to register with us as a processor. And one of the reasons we're requiring that, um, even if they're not actually doing any true like, processing with the biomass, is we want to ensure that we know who's handling the crop so that we can communicate that information to law enforcement. If someone has a storage facility you know, filled to the ceiling with hemp crops, someone's going to know. <laughs> and people can contact us, and we can let them know. Um, if that individual or that property is registered with our program. Um, but your definition of wholesalers was, um, it includes processing, transportation, um, and then the sales of cannabis and cannabis products. And I believe this is listed in Act 164, and then I guess in Title Seven right. somewhere, yeah. yeah. Um, which is really encompassing. Um, but again, so we, we don't have that wholesaler, we just lump it in with our processors um, definition. Who, who needs to register with us. Um, we do not require um, white labelers to register with us. So individuals that are processing products on behalf of other brands, they do not need to be registered with us. The brand needs to be registered with us because um, they're ultimately the individual or the company that's responsible for any label guarantees and for the testing and the record keeping, so on and so forth. Um, stop me if you have any questions as I move through the presentation. Um, so the, uh, some other elements um, of the Vermont Hemp Program is we have a consumer protection angle. Um, and again, that's the focus of our regulations in addition to um, registering individuals who are handling the crop. Um, we have uh, labeling requirements as well as standards um, for meeting the label guarantees that are um, listed on, on, on labels. Uh, we have record keeping and reporting requirements, so record keeping of um, where you get crops, um, the variety of the crops that you get, uh, or the um, cultivars, um, where it came from, um, how much the weight of that crop was. Um, there's there's a lot of record keeping, a lot of record keeping requirements um, within the program, and then as well uh, reporting to us if you have an exceedance of a, a potency um, requirement. We require testing by certified laboratories. The, the Vermont Cannabis Quality Control Program um, began in 2020, November of 2020. Um, we had to develop uh, application materials, so on and so forth. Um, uh, the certified lab program is to help um, serve the industry um, to, and for when those labs are doing testing, um, setting a standard for how they will report that information out so that we can have an apples to apples comparison between labs and between the various uh, analyses that are done by, by labs. Um, these certified labs have to be aware of our regulations, they have to have um, validated methods, and I'm going to go into that a little bit more. Um, so we do require use of certified labs. Currently we have um, two labs that are certified by the agency. Um, and we have a list available on our website. Um, so, and we've been trying to, you know, since we only had the program in place since November of 2020, um, we're still standing up that piece of our program. 
Um, we're moving uh, registrants, growers, and processors to use the certified labs, <laughs> but we also understand that we don't really have a lot of certified labs. Um, so it, we suspect that we'll have a year, another year of, um, of, of growers and processors being able to use the labs of their cho choice and those um, labs that they're currently working with to meet their testing requirements. But we will eventually, once we have <laughs> enough certified labs, um, require that individuals use those certified labs. Um, this is, I mean, obviously a function of having a program in place before you have certified labs in place. Um, and we as an agency, you know, we're not going to say nobody can put a product on a shelf until we have certified labs in place because that wasn't going to work for anybody. Um, and so we're still, we're still working towards getting enough certified labs um, in Vermont and elsewhere, we, we would happily allow um, individuals or labs from outside of the state to also become certified because uh, we do know that um, hemp producers, uh, growers and processors do use labs outside of the state of Vermont. Um, and then again, we're establishing a common vocabulary, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. So how do we do this? Um, very quick <laughs> overview of our program. We have three full-time employees. <laughs> um, uh, there's myself, um, and then we have a hemp inspector, and then we have the Cannabis Quality Control Program Compliance Specialist. Um, the, we have a Chief Policy Enforcement Officer that works across the agency that helps us with enforcement, um, does, you know, drafts many of our enforcement letters, um, and on occasion communicates with registrants. Uh, we have a general counsel, um, and these, these, these last three bullets here, uh, Pol Chief Policy Enforcement Officer, General Counsel, and then Carrie Jaguer, the Director of Public Health and Ag Resource Management, um, they're, you know, they interact with the program, but they're not dedicated to our program. Um, so those that are primarily dedicated are the three full-time employees. Um, what does the inspector do? They manage uh, all the, the registration process, both online and paper. Um, we do have an online registration portal, um, but we also accept, if needed, paper registrations. We understand that not everybody has access to the internet and we are willing to accept paper registrations. The online um, portal will accept credit card payments. We accept credit card payment up to $1,000. Um, if anything is beyond $1,000, um, you have to send in a check to the agency. Um, we also accept ACH, or electronic transfer of funds, um, through that online registration process. The, um, inspector, in the inspector communicates. This is Mike DiTomaso. Um, he's our inspector. <laughs> um, he may even be on this call. He is. Um, I see his name. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hi, Mike. <laughs> uh, um, but so he, he manages that process, he communicates with registrants, so if we are missing information as a part of our online registration process or in a paper application, um, or we needed a change to a registration, Mike spends the time and, 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 um, and communicates with our registrants. He's also really the face of the program because he's out there in the field doing inspections, he's the first point of contact. Um, he responds to general inquiries about the program, um, manages the complaints that we receive. We actually have an online environmental complaint form um, that is linked to the hemp website that an individual can you know, fill out. It actually covers multiple aspects of our, of our program, of the agency's programs, um, but we, we do have a, a, a way for people to communicate to us if they have a complaint um, out in the field, out in the world. Uh, Mike collects samples, um, random, does conducts random inspections. He's designed a number of standard operating procedures for the inspections that we, con con um, that we conduct here at the agency. Um, we're attempting to kind of develop a binder so that, you know, if we need to hire another inspector, it's like, here you go, this is what you're working on. Um, and this is how you're going to do it. <laughs> it also um, provides consistency within the program and how we um, interact with our, our registrants. Uh, and then as well, Mike works with, um, with Dave Huber. Dave Huber is our Chief Policy Enforcement Officer to um, implement consistent enforcement practices. Uh, our goal annually is to touch 20% um, percent of the registrants that we have. Um, currently with 417, it's approximately 80 that we'll work with this year. Um, and, and, and when I say touch, I mean like a random inspection and or response to a complaint. Um, 
during uh, 2020 and into this year, um, we developed, or Mike um, developed a virtual records inspection process because actually records are something you can do at a distance. You don't have to be within someone's space. Um, so it starts off with filling out a sheet about who you are, what you grow, how many acres or, um, uh, or area, square feet of cultivation that you have per cultivar. Um, if it's a product based one, you know, like what products are you selling um, and looking at labels, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and that's been kind of an effective way to, to reach people in the climate that we were working under. Um, but we're going to continue to do that again because it's an effective way to get information. Um, and oh, and looking at test records as well. Um, also, Mike goes out on random site visits and visits with registrants of the program, um, and then again, response to complaints. Uh, the most common enforcement actions and or complaints, actually, probably more um, apt term here is, um, is this person registered? Are they registered with the program? And so we do a fair bit of following up with um, individuals if, if someone has a concern that someone's not registered with us. Um, we also, through the records inspections, um, you know, check to make sure that they've filled out their pre-harvest sampling form correctly um, and that they have all the test, uh, testing requirements per that stage of that crop or that product. Um, and then as well that they're maintaining those records <laughs> and have access to them within their, um, their files. And then another complaint that we sometimes get is, um, which relates to whether or not land is registered um, for cultivation, is managing land. So, some instances there'll be land that has um, hemp growing on it. It's not registered with us, and it's clearly just a reseed from a prior year. Um, and if we find that there's hemp growing in a field or cannabis growing in a field, or just more broadly, because we don't know it's hemp until we have a test done. Um, and it's not registered with us. Um, we obviously require that individual to register, and then we try to provide some guidance and assistance, um, compliance assistance relative to please managing, please manage the land. <laughs> we don't want um, feral hemp crops um, spreading through the state of Vermont, as that I think is probably a fairly big risk to both the um, floral cultivation of hemp in our state as well as um, the cannabis cultivation. Uh, some of the issues um, that lead to this land management is the infrastructure that's put in, so like plastic sometimes prevents somebody from being able to, um, well, if they fail to harvest, um, then you can't just, you know, till or disc the soil up because you have to get the plastic out. So there's just a, a layer of things going on um, that create problems. And so, so we are actually interested in creating more guidance relative to managing land. Um, so compliance assistance or compliance uh, specialist with the Cannabis Quality Control Program. Um, that individual is, is Robert Chipman um, and he also spends some time in the Vermont um, uh, Ag and Environmental Lab uh, in Randolph. Um, and he uh, has assisted in developing the Cannabis Quality Control Program, did all the research relative to the contaminants that we wanted to test for in the um, action. Uh, limits uh, for when something is considered um, a potential um, risk um, to consumers. Uh, he has developed the um, list of materials that we will need in order to review an application uh, for a certified lab. Um, he actually reviews those application materials <laughs> um, after he receives them. And then um, we'll also, since this program is fairly new, um, we'll conduct random inspections of laboratories, either you know, looking at their data packages um, to ensure that um, the report that is a result of the data package, that they match up. Um, he's also currently um, designing an inter-laboratory comparison study relative to uh, potency. Um, and we're soon to be sending out those samples to all those labs that have uh, uh, expressed interest in participating, but this will be an anonymous um, comparison study, but it'll allow, like, the lab that's participating will be able to, will know which is their sample amongst all the samples, um, and then we can see the deviation between the results on something that is a known um, product to begin with. I'm not explaining this very well. And thankfully, Kerry Jaguer is in the room. <laughs> he has joined us. <laughs> And, and he can contribute if he feels necessary. But it'll be, it's, it's, we're really excited about it. Um, 
uh, doing this inter-laboratory comparison study. And we've received interest by, uh, I think it's seven labs, but up to like 14 analysts. And they'll run the same sample like three times. And then we'll look at it and we'll compare the results. Uh, but it'll, it'll inform, we're also going to look at the, um, the methods that they're using, either their, um, I guess not their grinding, because we're sending out ground samples, um, but you know, some of the methods that they use. Extraction. Is, thank you. Their extraction methods <laughs> um, to compare to see, you know, like what might be more effective or are certain extraction methods um, resulting in the same um, uh, potency. Um, anyway, moving on. I'm, I'm getting out of my depth, clearly. <laughs> but uh, so uh, we also, as a part of the cannabis quality control program and the work that um, Robert Shipman uh, has done and the research he has done, established um, contaminant thresholds for uh, microbiologicals, which include yeast and molds, and aerobic uh, micro microbial bacteria, as well as mycotoxins. Um, we have heavy metals um, action limits, pesticide action limits. Uh, please know that the pesticides that can be used on hemp crops are very limited. Um, EPA has approved, I'm going to guess, I think around like 62, 68, around there, um, to be used on hemp. Um, but we test for pesticides beyond that list, obviously, because um, that list <laughs> is a list of things that are okay to be used on hemp. Um, and we are looking at pesticides that are not approved to be used on hemp. Um, you can find them um, potentially on a hemp crop due to um, spray over, drift, um, improper use. Uh, and these are things that we are testing for within the hemp program. However, a misuse application or a, um, a drift situation, that is actually then handled by a separate division or a separate um, uh, program within the Public Health and Ag Resources Management Division. So the hemp program doesn't do that work. We're just requiring the test. Um, so again, here's an example of where we are relying on somebody else to help us do our jobs better. Um, we also test for residual solvents, um, such as ethanol, butane, hexane, propane, acetone, the list goes on and on. Um, we currently, within the hemp program, allow for CO2 extraction, um, ethanol extraction, uh, mechanical extraction and lipid extraction. We within the, within the rules, the rules allow for an individual to approach us for another extraction method um, that can be approved by the secretary, um, just so that we weren't like closing the door on new technology. Um, this and what we're talking about is primary botanical extraction, not secondary extraction. After you've done your primary extraction. Um, we do know that some of those secondary processes may use some of these chemicals, which is another, re you know, a reason why we test um, for these residual solvents that can be harmful. Um, so this is where I'm truly at my depth. Um, <laughs> certifying laboratories. Uh, the, we require um, at least, so we require labs to be ISO accredited. Um, or on their way to obtaining ISO accreditation. Um, there's a number of third party organizations out there that offer this um, accreditation. We look at the facilities that where the testing is being conducted. Um, we review their sample storage techniques. We review their chain of custody, staff qualifications. Um, we review their methods and their standard operating procedures for the um, testing methods that they're gonna use, make sure that they're um, validated methods. Uh, we review their measurements of uncertainty, um, their uh, LOQs and LODs, limit of quantitation. Limit of detection. And limit of detection, thank you, Carrie. Uh, <laughs> we wanna review how they are gonna address their complaints that they receive at their lab, um, how they will go about, if they, ha you know, if they had to revise uh, a certificate of analysis, how would they go about doing that and what measures are in place um, to ensure that both the client knows and you know, whatever, you know, we, just, we want to make sure that everything is appropriately managed within the lab. And that is part of our review um, <clears throat> for labs to become certified within the program. 
and I've mentioned this a little bit already, um, besides the work that the hemp program does with registration, enforcement, record keeping, requiring testing, um, and certifying labs and establishing you know, an interlaboratory comparison study that will support labs, <laughs> um, we rely on a lot of other programs within the Agency of Agriculture. The other item um, is that all of us within the Agency of Agriculture are out there doing outreach and education. The hemp program does it, the pesticide program does it, um, Vail participates in conferences as well and workshops. Um, we in the HEP program develop um, frequently asked questions worksheets and guidance documents on how to use our registration processes. <laughs> We're our phone call away. Um, one of the things that I believe in is, is customer service, like we serve the customer, that's what we're here for. You're going to call me up, you have a question, I'm going to call you back and try to get you an answer. Um, if I can't get you an answer, I'm still going to call you back and say I can't get you an answer right now, um, but we'll look into it. Uh, we work with UVM um, pretty closely on conferences and workshops. Um, we've participated in um, meetings with banking and insurance companies. Um, we've made presentations before Vermont Cannabis Solutions, um, uh, like afternoon luncheons to talk about our program. And, and these are all opportunities for us that we actually don't have to coordinate, but we can go out there and get in touch with the community. So they're great, great opportunities. Um, so relative to regulatory provisions in farming, um, just quickly, uh, hemp is farming. It's an agricultural commodity. Um, so within the required agricultural practices, uh, there's a definition of farming. I've highlighted like three things that I think apply to hemp specifically. Um, hemp is both growing food, fiber, and is a horticultural crop. Um, so it meets the definition when you're cultivating the land. Um, you can do it in a greenhouse. That is considered farming. Um, it includes the on-site storage preparation and sale of that hemp product that is principally produced on the farm. Uh, that is all farming. And if you're farming, then the agricultural practices, the required agricultural practices apply to your operation. Um, and this is where um, Ryan was talking about uh, the rules that, that fill in um, the regulatory framework where other environmental regulations don't apply, the required agricultural practices apply. And that's why we have those regulations in place. And so those include these items here, um, including the construction of farm structures and farm structures are um, you know buildings that are used in the course of your daily agricultural activities. Um, and if you're farming and the required agricultural practices apply to your operation, then a municipal land use regulation cannot regulate you. That includes the construction of farm structures. Um, and so that is the current lay of the land. How do we achieve this? Uh, the agency will receive questions from both farmers and from municipalities regarding whether or not the construction of their building or the activity that they're engaged in is regulated by the required agricultural practices. This is very high level. This is not in the weeds. <laughs> um, and we can certainly talk about it more. But, um, and the agency will respond and write letters. Um, in fact, this is a letter I wrote. This is the concluding paragraph of a letter I wrote um, a while ago regarding the operation of a greenhouse. Um, we make a determination that we believe it's farming and that the required agricultural practices apply. Um, this is a letter, this is how I did it. I actually can't be certain how it's done today. We would share that information with the municipality. The municipality would take that under consideration to determine whether or not they wanted to regulate that land use or the construction of that building. Uh, if they agreed with us, then they wouldn't. If they disagreed with us, then they would go through their regular regulatory process. Um, through their development review board or their um, uh, uh, one of their regulatory boards. Um, likewise, uh, Act 250 uses the same definition, generally the same definition as farming, um, and they also have um, an exception for um, regulating farming and other uh, working lands types of businesses. This is administered by the district coordinators and district commissions in the regions across the state. Um, the agency participates relative to the 9B primary agricultural soils criteria. Um, I can't think of a time when we were asked, 
maybe one or two times where we were asked to provide our opinion on their, their definition of farming and whether or not we believed it was farming um, and, or what aspects of an operation is considered farming. Um, but um, farming is generally not regulated by Act 250. Uh, there is a specific exemption for when a permit amendment is happening under certain circumstances that if, if what is happening is farming, um, it is not reviewed even under a, a, a permit amendment. Um, and I'm probably not giving this its due. Um, I would encourage you to speak with, obviously, the Natural Resources Board um, with respect to that. But it is similar um, to what the agency does in application of its required agricultural practices. Um, however, not asked to comment on this, I just wanted to share Vermont's right to farm law. Um, and this is just the purpose section, and there are a lot of words on this page. Um, but um, individuals that are engaged in farming um, have a, it, it, you know, it, there's a limitation on bringing a civil suit, uh, a private civil suit against an individual that's engaged in farming to the extent that um, it isn't a significant change in the activities that were occurring before the new activity occurs. <laughs> Again, not giving it its due. <laughs> I'm not an attorney. <laughs> Um, but it, the, the purpose does focus on, you know, like, agriculture is important to the state of Vermont. Um, we cherish our open lands um, and our working landscapes. So, so that's what I have. That's great. Because, <laughs> honestly, I was going to say, I, just the questions that I have might take up a significant amount of time. <laughs> okay. Um, so God, I hope I can about, answer them. <laughs> we have about half an hour, I, I think. Um, Maybe even longer. Yeah, potentially longer, um, but I would open it up to questions from uh, two board members first. Um, I, Stephanie, I have a question about the labs. From sure. the time that you determined, you know, what a certified lab needed to have, how long did it take to start certifying labs? Um, it, uh, so once uh, we developed the program, and once we launched it, we were ready to go. We were ready to accept applications. Um, once we receive the information that is necessary, um, there's probably a little bit of back and forth, um, but I think <coughs> two weeks tops, you know, not very long. Um, BIA has been through the lab certification process. Uh, you certainly get their perspective on it, but that's um, my experience, what I understand. And this is the piece that really is plug and play. Okay. It's the, the all the same analytes all the same analytes, whether it's a hemp or THC, everything that uh, a cannabis lab needs is is part of this um, certification program. Yeah, these, yeah. And it's the first place we should partner. Um, our program can be your program, your program can be our program. Um, just looking across the country, the foundation of a consumer protection program for cannabis is the laboratory piece. And we, we saw Oregon struggle with that, we saw Colorado struggle with that. It's just not the piece that was thought of first, it was the piece that got inserted after. This is a very robust uh, lab certification program that includes all, all the pieces that are necessary. Great. Yeah. I also want to follow up that much of our contaminants that we've got, you know, that we've got listed, um, we're, we actually drew from many cannabis programs because okay. hemp didn't have this outline for it. Um, so, and we're one of the few states where this is contained within the agriculture, um, the agency of an agency or department of agriculture. In some instances, it's located within a department of health. Mm -hmm. I have a follow up on that. Colorado, sorry, Colorado. The pesticide pieces with agriculture, the um, contaminant piece is with the Board of Health, the municipal boards of health, because they do it by county in Colorado. And the other, the heavy metals piece is independent labs. So this puts it all in one place. Sorry, James. No. Um, so are there unique features of high THC cannabis versus hemp, um, or the cultivation practices, or even just kind of the federal status of marijuana, high THC cannabis, 
where we would need to significantly modify some of your thresholds or some of your other consumer protection rules. It sounds like you've got a lot of them from the kind of high THC cannabis world. Yeah. So I don't see any difference. Um, I mean, obviously from a potency perspective, like that's obviously <laughs> different. Um, but many of, but that doesn't mean, you know, if I think, what is it, 30% on a yeah. plant, on a crop, um, it's still the same methods. Yeah. Like none of that okay. has changed. Yes. It's just a different number. Um, and in fact, under Act 164, the Agency of Agriculture was required to establish contaminant thresholds for cannabis and cannabis products. Um, and um, I don't know if it's a threshold or a standard for label guarantees. And so we, we did do that. That's already contained within our cannabis quality control program, despite us not regulating cannabis. <laughs> We really focus on a consumer protection piece that goes above and beyond what USDA was asking for for him, um, and partly because I was sitting in on the um, previous conversations about uh, a tax and regulate program. Um, your question highlighted one piece that I think is a policy decision um, that we don't need to decide now, but what is dry? What is dry? Um, is dry zero moisture or is dry shelf stable 13 to 15 percent moisture? Under the farm bill, they defined it as zero percent moisture, but it's going to be tricky when you are looking at cannabis that a flower that for sale that's up in the high 20s, if you dry it to zero percent, it might go over 30 percent. But if, at, if it's shelf stable at 15% moisture, you're probably below that 3% number. So just some little things to think about as, as you move forward. What's dry? Is dry zero moisture or is dry shelf stable? Or at consumption. Like if someone's going to, yeah, if you, if you get it to 13% or 15%, I think 13% is what we have in, is what we call a dry weight basis in the hemp rules. Um, it's, you know, that's when it's consumed. Someone's not going to go home and try it more. <laughs> Maybe they will. I don't know. Um, and then the other piece on the moisture, just as a tangent, I'm sorry, um, is that the moisture also, also like how you uh, manage your crop um, for, for stability reasons and to um, reduce the risk of uh, contamination due to microbiologicals. So there's that number, too, which we believe is around 13%. I had a, if, I had a couple questions um, back to the laboratory context. So um, it's really exciting to hear that, that. Well, my question was going to be similar to Julie's. Really exciting to hear that there's a potential glide path for for what you've already done from a laboratory context. How we can kind of use that um, with what we're trying to accomplish. You said, I believe there's two labs in the state that have met your certification standard thus far, and seven that are in the process. Let me rephrase. Okay. Okay. We have two labs that have gone through the certification process for specific um, testing areas. Okay. So it's not the full. Um, I gamut. should go back. It's not the full gamut. Okay. Um, we have uh, potency. Bia is currently certified to conduct potency testing, and then Endine has been certified to conduct heavy metals and molds and yeasts and um an, hmm? did they get the pesticide piece no they didn't get the pesticide piece and another i can't remember which i apologize and um but uh so we don't have currently pesticides we okay. don't have um solvents as of yet um my understanding is that you can add those at any point during the year um and and i'm certain that labs will move forward. Um, we've also received an application from the Vermont um, Agriculture Environmental Lab from Vail um, to become a certified lab in potency as well, um, but that is currently under review. Great. Um, that's good to know, and I guess my follow-up to that is, is I would imagine that we might not have as much flexibility when our program launches from this laboratory certification perspective, like I know that the hemp program has done working with people until they've achieved certification, maybe we will. Uh, I don't know, I'm erring on the side of caution there, but do you, between now and 
18 months from now, 12 months from now, do you expect, where do you expect those other potential labs to be in this process? And I know there's a lot of business decisions that those labs need to make if they want to actually come into this market and offer these services, but just generally speaking. Um, I don't have a crystal ball as to how many labs we will have um, certified uh, in 18 months. I, I can't tell you that. We know we have interest from labs to participate. Right. Um, and I did highlight initially that we had a program and we were registering processors before we had a certified lab program in place. Mm -hmm. um, the Cannabis Control Board has an opportunity um, to put the certified lab program as a, um, to require it first <laughs> before you have products hitting shelves, um, which w would prevent the problem that we're experiencing. <laughs> where we don't have enough certified labs currently in place. Yeah, no, totally. I want to make sure we have a, a good understanding of the landscape as yeah. we try to anticipate as many bottlenecks as we can, knowing that yeah. we can't anticipate all. Um, I had another question on this, well, two more questions on this specific topic sure. before we kind of jump yeah, through her presentation. Um, pesticides. Yeah. I know EPA has dipped their toe into the, the water for hemp on, you said 60 to 70-ish. Maybe, Carrie, maybe this question is for you. How are, how are other states handling, um, from a high THC adult use perspective, on farm applicators and pesticides when those haven't been technically approved for high THC cannabis use? So they've all done it very differently. Um, Nevada is the worst. In okay. particular, they've looked at a slew of pesticide labels. If it isn't expressly prohibited on the label, they allow it. So you get a lot of older chemistries that um, we don't want to see used on cannabis because the inhalation studies haven't been done. Um, Oregon, I, I like what they've done. They've allowed the uh, minimum use okay. sort of um, pesticides, but <clears throat> California is currently doing registration packages for specific active, in, active ingredients, um, doing the inhalation studies, doing the um, other toxicological studies. So I think what's coming out of California right now is the best and most um, applicable science for what's appropriate to be used on cannabis. Okay. I think I can. Let's speak for us when we say we're looking forward to working with you as we figure that, that issue out. Um, last but not least, um, I wanted to talk about remediation and destruction. I don't know if it might be a prudent time to at least talk with me and, and my colleagues about how you handle remediation. I can't exactly remember where from a remediation perspective USDA is. I know I assisted the two of you in writing some comments on what we wanted to see from a remediation perspective, but if a product tests over a certain potency, um, what kind of allowable remediation does the program have for folks to kind of work their way back under the TV? Yeah, so, so per USDA on the crop side, um, the, 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 there is an opportunity to remediate a crop. So if you um, this, there's specific sampling guidance. So if you're within a USDA approved program, um, you're taking one flowering top from an acre. Um, and you're, that flowering five to eight inches, six to, I don't know, something like that. Um, that's the cutting, the cut that you take in order for, for the test to be conducted. If that um, flower exceeds the potency requirements, you have an opportunity to harvest your entire crop, um, chip it, the entire plant, um, and then you're diluting it with stems and leaves and stock, um, and then having it retested for the purposes of um, compliance at that point. And so, so that's that's what's available from a re remediation standpoint. Um, the, oh, the other opportunity is to cut off all flowers and then just use the stock in a fiber market. So it's still providing a market opportunity for that crop. Um, so those are the two opportunities that exist for hemp. Um, the other opportunity, or no, the other, the disposal side 
is um, you can do on-farm on disposal. So you can compost, you can deep burial, uh, deep, bury it deep, you can um, disc it back into the soil. And I know that the plant, or I understand, I don't know, I understand that the plant has a lot of nutrients kind of like um, held up within the plant itself. And so returning it to the soil isn't a bad way if you had a failure on a crop. Um, some of the issues or challenges I see with the remediation opportunities is that you can't test until, again, until you've actually harvested all your entire crop, um, which means you're potentially throwing good money after bad. <laughs> um, and then you're you know, gambling with the test on the other side. But I, I suppose you, you could probably um, do some science and figure out whether or not you'll be compliant in the end. Yeah, because we're working with potency limits from the flower and concentrate perspective. It's something that we're gonna have to have to think about if somebody's product tests over those and what opportunities are offered to get those products in compliance unless yes. it needs to be destroyed. So yeah, on a product side, um, I would think, you know, you would, it depends on when you're testing. Um, mm -hmm. Like if you're working in, at large scales, you can probably determine whether or not your product's gonna pass, you know, by sampling that product. And we actually have post-harvest and product sampling guidelines that we've developed um, for folks in the hemp industry um, to try to get um, a um, composite sample of, you know, lots of liters, <laughs> liters of concentrate or extract. Um, but you can reformulate potentially if, you, yeah. if you're not going to meet that potency requirement on a larger scale. Like I'm it's not. Going um, to sort yeah. of suggest that our compliance point is the crop. Your compliance point is the point of sale, mm -hmm. yeah. so there is more control. Um, and if a flower, if flower is over thirty percent, you're either introducing more, more more moisture to bring it down, or running it through a market that that's making edibles or concentrates. Right. And for that matter, if you don't meet a contaminant level that too requires remediation. Like, mm -hmm. throw potency aside, let's talk about contaminants. So you have something that's rich and full of colony forming units of yeasts and molds. Um, you can extract that and then you'll eliminate that contaminant. Um, so there is another market down the road, but obviously best to have good practices in place to avoid that issue in the first place. And I think something different where we're running into yeasts and molds or over 0.3, you're gonna be running into pesticide contamination issues more than potency, pesticide or powdery mildew. Um, <clears throat> any thoughts on the, I mean, from the lessons you all have learned, are there any thoughts on the sequencing of the licensing that we should be doing as far as just like, when should we be granting testing licenses, cultivator licenses, uh, retail licenses, just, I know you guys don't do the retail side of things, but I'm just curious, like, uh, I think the legislation contemplates cultivators go first, then testing, you know, they have these windows for us. Yeah, I think testing's first. Testing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it needs to be first by right. six months. Yeah. Yeah, because then you're going to have the labs wanting to get their, well, once it's open to them, they're going to want to get their um, licenses to test. Yeah. Um, and then they might be sitting a little bit waiting for right. processors and growers to come on board or wholesalers. Yeah. Um, I don't know if wholesalers will have to have testing complete. Like, that's another thing you'll have to think about is at what stage of product development are you, it's probably, well, it's end product, I guess, is what Carrie said. So it'll be is the, the end, testing. is the testing phase, yeah. yeah. What's the fee associated with a certified lab? $1,500. $1, and that's just within the agency. There are, you know, lots of costs right. associated with becoming no, a certified just, lab. <laughs> that I, I, I so certification is by far the most costly piece. And we're, we're not requiring it right off the bat. Like, but you need to be heading in that direction. At least some yeah. sort of third party verification. Yeah. Um, how long did your initial rulemaking take? Well, it took a while. So we started, I think, was it a year? Maybe. I feel like we had meetings in 2019 mm -hmm. in like the Newport area in May. Mm -hmm. um, we actually had to extend our deadline. So whatever the rules are regarding rulemaking, we had to extend the deadline. Um, they didn't become effective until May of 2020. 
So I feel like you have like nine months to get it to over the finish line, and we had to ask for an extension. It was the middle of, I'm not going to throw it on COVID, but it was the middle of COVID, yeah. and it just kind of fell off the radar a little bit. Um, maybe it didn't fall off the radar. That's probably not the right way. Um, but Priority shift. Yeah, priority <laughs> shift, indeed. And that, that common vocabulary that you talked about, is that something that we can just adopt? Is that kind of like now a Vermont standard? Is that the vocabulary is, is I mean, we, we, we appropriate many marketing terms yeah. within the Vermont hemp rules. Um, so isolate, distillate, full spectrum, broad spectrum, um, biomass, like, uh, and there are more terms actually. We have a fix it list. You always have a pick fix it list somewhere <laughs> to add things. Um, but you know, like from your, you, maybe you guys wanted to find what Keith is. Maybe you wanted to find what um, bowl hash is. I, you know, I don't know. But if we all know what they are, then we're not all. You know, people use those terms. Then it's consistent, and the consumer knows. You know, the producer, processor knows. Um, it's just a consistent yeah. marketing labeling plan. Um, so that could be our basis, but we could kind of expand it further. Kind of specific yeah, specific like specific. we define dry weight food. Right. Yeah. You might want to, you know, food establishments. I don't know if you're gonna. If those are, and those you can. There are terms all over state government that you may want to look to to make sure that you're using the same term. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can definitely. You can take any of our terms. <laughs> Great. Thank you. That's what we're here for. <laughs> So you built a, you built the framework. You have three employees on the kind of consumer safety, uh, compliance and enforcement side yep. of things um, in the cannabis quality program. How do you have the ability to scale that up for high THC cannabis, and how long would that take? Sorry, if that's probably you. Maybe haven't thought about it. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it. Um, it really depends on. Where we draw the line, yeah, yeah, you know, to conduct a consumer protection program, yeah, like like we have for him, would be relatively fast because we do have currently five pesticide inspectors doing the pesticide yeah. use. We have a uh, lab staff doing all the different analysis plus Bob. Um, yeah. So the infrastructure is there, and, and the legs go deep. But in order to <clears throat> what right now. You know, Mike's, Steph, you saw the number, 20% of the registrants are randomly inspected. Yeah. You might want 100%. Yeah. We've got, we, at our top was what, almost 900 registrants? Um, 1,300. 1,300 registrants. Yep. <laughs> Is that processors and producers? Yeah. yeah. Well, so it's interesting because I want to admit that the hemp program has, you know, like we're riding the wave with USDA, we're riding the wave of, you know, changes in Vermont law. Um, so I do believe that the 1,300 registrants was both growers and processors because we had one registration process at that point in time. I think that um, was in the 2019. Year, that was the year I crunched that data. Yeah, yeah. So it probably was both. Um, yeah, anyway, making excuses for <laughs> what I'm trying to recollect. But um, yeah. where you draw the line, Stephanie had mentioned that Mike's got a sort of template what his job is, what we're looking for, and how to do that job, and then you can apply that in it regionally, um, how whatever is most appropriate. Yeah. Um, so it is it scalable very quickly depending on the resource need. Yeah, growing and processing most definitely. Yeah. Um, that's actually very easy to to address the registration of those individuals. And if Mike goes in and sees pesticides that he shouldn't see, that's an immediate referral to the pesticide inspectors. Yeah. Um, and we have others that can do that as well, as I look over at fire safety. <laughs> <laughs> Provide those <Right>. referrals. <laughs> We've been talking a little bit, if anyone, feel, please feel free to jump in. Um, uh, we've been talking a little bit about certified labs, of course, and you mentioned that there's probably not enough certified labs for all of the hemp restaurants. Um, not today, yes. Right. How many would that be for your just for the, the hemp 
their strengths, not for the potential candidate, like the, um, the double use rent market? I don't think I've ever actually done a calculation, um, but I can say that our hemp registrants, based on the um, lab results that I've seen, I, I think it's primarily, it's probably under 10 labs yeah. where we see, you know, with their different names across the top of those certificates of analysis. Um, so it's probably between 10 and 15 yeah. for the hemp program, but then also understand that people are choosing a lab that they like and to they work with. So it's, state as well. and they go out of state, yeah. That ability in, our market. in our market, you're right, yeah. they will not. That's true, that's true. Can I just ask a follow up to that? Um, going back, you said that you had labs that are certified for specific things. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that folks have to send samples to multiple labs in order to meet that certified lab requirement? Quite possibly, yes. Okay. Yes. And can that get right right now? Right, right now. now. But yes. if one were to do it all, mm -hmm. right, they wouldn't have to do that. I'm they just wouldn't trying have to get to a sense that. of yeah. timeline for someone or cost or See, I'm sorry. No, no, please. No. You, you saw via diagnostics. They can do everything. Yeah. They're only certified in a few pieces. But if you were to send a sample to via, you could still order the entire suite. That's true. We'd only accept the result for the piece they're certified in. Okay. <clears throat> and you're going to hear from them later today. I'm sure they'll share what their intentions are. Are there any... Um, consumer protection issues that have come up in the hemp business that are public that, you know, are not, that, you know, that have been... Yeah, I mean, concerns about um, concentration of products on the shelf, concerns about um, uh, mold yeah. um, or contaminants. Shelf life stability and stuff. Um, we don't have, it's not necessarily a shelf life related thing, it's just, it, just you know, whether or not the product is, um, meets our contamination or our contamination <coughs> limits for, for mold. Yeah, and most of, the, most of the calls we've received this season, or last season, yeah, were over uh, the mold. The mold. Yeah. mold last year yeah. was a really hard year, it was a wet year towards yeah. the end of the season. And, uh, and frost. And frost, yeah. Three so sustained the, days of frost. But luckily, it's not the aflatoxin, not the toxic ones. It's primarily the uh, botrytis, or bug rot, or powdery mildew. Yeah. Um, last question. Um, sorry, and I'd like to give Brent a chance to also jump in if she has anything. But um, um, you talked about kind of nurseries. Mm -hmm. To me, nurseries is one of these issues that spans our jurisdiction and the can in the hemp jurisdiction because it's not flowering, it's not high THC cannabis. Yep. But I, it's my understanding, and I don't know enough about the plant itself, but that um, there's certain genetics that would yield most likely not high CBD cannabis, but high THC cannabis. But, um, so I'm trying to think, we've been hearing that we should be thinking about a specific nursery license, we should think about that. Um, do you have any thoughts about like, whose jurisdiction that would fall under. It seems almost silly to have a cannabis quality control program and then a separate <laughs> adult use. Yeah, like. yeah, I mean, I, I don't, you know, like if, if there's, a, just personally, if there's a program in the state that registers the business nursery, yeah. why not take advantage of that? Um, <laughs> same, same division, separate <laughs> set of inspectors, but we do have Nursery inspectors, yeah. yeah, and we we are currently registering the registering the folks that are producing starts as nurseries. Yeah, yeah. You've got something. One, a few things that we learned in the HEMP program that we need to consider is folks are going to be producing starts, yeah. clones or seeds, and selling them to the people who are going to grow them, and also. Um, we will have industry in the state that will be seed producers. Right now, it's if you it's um, seven leaf genetics. Mm -hmm. They're a hemp producer, but they don't sell any hemp. They sell seeds. They produce seeds and sell genetics. And that in infrastructure and industry will end up in the state as well. You'll have people producing seeds for a high THC cannabis market that are never taking that to flower. Uh, and if they are, it'll be 
primarily for research. So that nursery component will need to be captured, um, even though we don't have a tax and regulate market. Um, you look online, the, the clone market in the state is really strong. We have a lot of people, everybody buying their six plants um, from people producing clones in anywhere from 10 to $25 a plant. So some of those are registered nurseries and some weren't. There's also, I mean, what's interesting is that as a part of the USDA hemp production program, um, they are providing states uh, the opportunity to establish flexibility on sampling nurseries. So it's a performance-based sampling protocol, and they've asked states to look at that. And so we've thought about it a little bit, like we don't want to go out to nurseries and sample because <laughs> there's no reason to. Um, but we've kind of put together a list of things that would then qualify them as a nursery. Like if you're not bringing things to flower and you have to report to us the square footage of your floor, you have to let us know when you destroy the crop if you didn't actually sell it off your floor, like things like that. And it could easily translate to a nursery um, inspection and or license issued by the agency. If you wanted to use our program, inspections could be done here um, to your standards uh, to ensure that uh, crops are managed appropriately. And those are pieces that we all, by statute, if somebody's selling seeds, we have to register right. them yep. as a seed dealer. If somebody's selling nursery stock, we statutorily have to register them as a nursery. So we'll decide where that. It'll be a close coordination with us no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. In this area and many others. Um, do you have anything? Um, I do. I wondered if you could tell me um, if you if your goal was to touch 100% of uh, your registrants, how many mics do you think you would need? <laughs> um, so, well, let's just say five. 20%? Just, okay. Straight up, yeah. And is that true like today or at the outside of the program? Um, that's today. Okay. With 1,300 registrants, actually, I bet you still could because Mike does Mike does a lot more than just right. inspections. Right. Um, so, it, you probably could still do it with five. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was trying to get out of that interface. Yeah. yeah. How many inspectors do we have in the? Well, it's still fewer. Yeah. I don't know. Never mind. I was thinking about the water quality program as a comparison. Mm -hmm. No. Probably you bring not. on temp inspectors too. Mm -hmm. Seasonal temp temporary inspectors too, right? We have. Them. Yeah, you know, yeah. We do for the APRA program. Okay. I think yeah. that, I don't think temporary necessarily, maybe a temp, maybe you could do it, but Not their expensive. responsibilities would be pretty limited. Like, I feel yeah. like the nuances of your program would be such that you would want full-time employees who are, you know, regimented and are following. Um, and let's just say that's five, but hemp is primarily grown outdoors. Mm -hmm. So we're hitting everybody during one growing season. Right. If you've got indoor growing operations that are going year round, the burden for that month before harvest goes away. Yeah. yeah. But true. that five is a good number. We we have five inspectors covering the state doing the pesticide, feed, seed, fertilizer, hemp, uh, not hemp. Uh, what else do they do? Food, fertilizer. There's more. Don't they do and food? they do housing inspections. Don't for they do food for a pet food? And, or and retail food. inspections. Oh, food. Products. Yeah. And they, five of them cover the state. It's regional. And they hit all the sort of class B pesticide dealers and class A pesticide dealers. The class A's are your big ag shops. They hit them multiple times a year. The other ones are on a two-year cycle, so we're hitting every house, Sean Holos, Home Depot, and Mom and Pop hardware store doing a pesticide inspection every other year. And we could do it every year, but we like to throw in golf courses and nurseries and right away inspections too. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I got one more yeah. question, um, and I recognize this question might be better suited for Mike. I'm not going to put him on the spot until I know he's, he's listening. So uh, last week. Um, we talked about greenhouses with the Department of Energy or the, the Public Service Department. I think the two of you may have weighed in on, on some of my questions. Um, I have, in your experience with folks that have cultivated hemp from a greenhouse perspective, I just wanted to touch on how 
efficient. I know that I'm sure they run the gamut of, a, of age um, and efficiency right now, but I'm wondering, and it's a question in my head, how ready would folks that might want to grow high T THC cannabis in a greenhouse, will they meet the, depart or the PSD's requirements? So she, she had mentioned two, la two layers of poly, yeah. and that's the, with the air between right. them. Every greenhouse that I've seen has run, is running two layers of poly. Okay. That's how you buy a greenhouse cover. I just didn't want those folks to feel like they're getting another additional cost depending on their cultivation model. So that's the that's the greenhouses. When you're talking about the high tunnels, high tunnels run mm -hmm. one layer of poly. The high tunnels will never meet that. But the high tunnel, you're not using year round. Right. You're just they're not going to hit that 180 day threshold. Yeah. Yep. That's why I think defining what you mean by greenhouse right. <laughs> will be very helpful. <laughs> something I'm thinking about. So. And they use that. Uh, the two layers of poly for rigidity. So if you've got air between the layers of poly, you're more apt to survive the winter. Just gotcha. It's a trade-off. That's all I got. Uh, this has been fascinating. Anyone else? I think I'm good. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, thank you. And um, I said that the entire advisory committee has been named. I, I actually don't know who on the team is going to be there. I know that you, you guys might uh, both be there or maybe one or the other, but we are look forward to it. Just if you get one, you get us both. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but we look forward to collaborating with you and keeping the conversation going. Excellent. Great. Thank you. So um, next on our agenda is public comment. We, we have several public comment periods. Um, throughout the day. I would like to try and keep us on track a little bit. So um, please, uh, if you've joined us um, via the link, uh, please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a comment. This is Grant, Group and Policy Director at Earl Vermont. Nice to see everybody again. Um, thanks, Carrie and Stephanie, for that great presentation of the hemp program. Uh, I think it's really critical to look at these programs in parallel, and I'm heartened to hear you all discussing like ways that there could be overlap, both for efficiency's sake, but also just for, for all kinds of reasons. Um, two things I just wanted to highlight from that conversation. One was about breeding, and I think one thing that we've been hearing from a lot of folks is that you know, this is actually a really prime area people are interested in. Um, we live in a really unique climate, and um, breeding for these conditions is, is a thing that a lot of people may be looking forward to and could be a really unique <clears throat> place for Vermont to have a, a market and a niche going forward. So thinking about that critically makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think the differentiation between high tunnels and greenhouses is the other thing I just wanted to hit on. And I think as you're moving across the agricultural landscape, um, that difference you know, is very stark uh, in terms of what crops are being grown, in terms of costs, in terms of what types of farms have them and don't. Um, but that's it. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you, Graham. Uh, next on the list is uh, Jeffrey. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, actually, good morning. So <laughs> um, can everybody still hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, I've got headphones on, so thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to echo uh, my colleague uh, Graham's sentiments uh, about the previous speakers. Uh, thank you to Carrie and Stephanie. That was excellent. And Mike and everyone else that participated. Uh, thank you to the board for uh, making this space. Uh, I do want to uh, just pick up on some of the points that uh, Graham had mentioned. Um, by the way, for the record, uh, my name is Jeffrey Costello. Um, co-founder and executive director of Vermont Growers Association, uh, the, the trade association for Vermont's uh, cannabis professionals. Think of us as the Vermont Growers Association, very similar. Um, a lot of our uh, members uh, are breeders, cannabis breeders, uh, and those interested in entering the market uh, to sell teens or starts. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that. Um, one of the things that will be uh, incumbent on Vermont when it comes to establishing its brand 
uh, with regards to the um, inevitable federal legalization of high THC cannabis, will be establishing a uniquely Vermont brand and directly tied to that is breeding and the development of unique and regional genetics specific to Vermont, specific to this region. Um, this gets into uh, what we talk about in the cannabis industry as IP, intellectual property and genetics. Uh, these are more advanced, sophisticated conversations that I look forward to, but this is the foundation for that. So I urge you guys to keep that in mind as you uh, think about regulations and ways for uh, these Vermonters to access the marketplace. Uh, that is important for federal legalization and preparing Vermont for exporting our craft products. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Anyone else that's uh, joined via the link that wants to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. And uh, if anyone's joined us uh, by the phone, um, hold on one second. Loretta, would you like to make a comment, please? I think you should be able to yeah. unmute yourself. Okay, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Um, yep. Thank you very much. I'm I'm really enjoying this conversation as as a medical cannabis uh, patient, and it it's just mind blowing to me that hemp has all of these restrictions for heavy metals and testing when the medical cannabis industry does currently. Thank you very much for your work, guys. Thank you, Loretta. Um, yes. Stephanie in the room um, <laughs> with the agency. I just wanted to highlight, I didn't uh, mention this previously, but within the um, hemp uh, authority to regulate in chapter 34 of, of title six, it includes hemp seed labeling standards. And so we do have a, a provision within our hemp program that outlines um, some standards for labeling of hemp seeds specifically, including requirements for potency, so on and so forth. Um, and based on some of the comments that were given um, just now, it, it, there's potentially another opportunity, yeah. and I just wanted to highlight it. I'm not prepared to talk about it at any more length than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for flagging that. Um, so anyone, anyone else from the link uh, would, that would like to make a public comment, please just raise your, raise your hands, virtual hands. Okay, um, anyone, do you wanna make a comment? I hadn't planned to, but uh, recently I've gone through the program with hemp. I've been involved in the UVM and some of the conferences. I also recently applied for a hemp license and I just wanna comment that it's been, the customer service aspect that you referred to has been outstanding. You guys have been helpful. You've been very supportive in the outreach and it's uh, it's been a pleasant experience. So thank, thank you. You guys <laughs> did a great job. Um, anyone else uh, who joined maybe by the phone? I'm not seeing anyone join by phone, but if there is anyone, um, you hit star six to unmute yourself and you can make a public comment. Okay. Um, we are very slightly ahead of schedule, um, but our next witnesses are here. If you guys are ready to go. We are. We can. Did you make Ben that presenter today? Yeah, we have can. a short PowerPoint. Why don't so the chairperson? Why don't suggest that we take just a very quick break, get them on the table and set up, and come Great. back at the bottom of the hour? Does that work? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. At eleven thirty. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a six-minute break here uh, and come back at eleven thirty. Where's the bar? Take her on mute. Um, <laughs> all right, we're going to back up a second because we realized that we were on mute. Sorry to the folks listening in. So we've got Ben Moffat here with us, Assistant State Fire Marshal, um, also the Barrier Regional Manager. We've got Landon Wheeler with us, an Assistant State Fire Marshal, Springfield Regional Manager. And in my conversations um, with Stephanie in, in preparation for today, um, I think um, we were all in agreement that it was uh, really important that the board hears from the two of you. It's my understanding that the two of you have kind of ran point um, from a educational perspective uh, to state partners, but also to the public when it comes to um, understanding fire safety, building code requirements from a fire safety context. 
and understanding what other guidance is out there, what other controlling principles are out there to make sure that what we're doing is, is safe from a uh, perspective of the, those that are handling a certain process, but also making sure that that trickles down into um, you know, how consumers use certain products. So with, you know, with that introduction, um, take it away. All right, thank you very much. So I guess I go first. My name is Landon Wheeler. I'm an assistant state fire marshal. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I've been with the Division of Fire Safety for about 15 years. I have 25 years in the fire service um, in total. And I'm a lead contact for the hemp permitting process for the Division of Fire Safety. Um, because the process was so new and there's so many specific hazards that are addressed with it, um, Ben and I um, received and researched specific training and education so that we could assist the rest of the Division of Fire Safety in that process. Um, and we've continued that throughout. <clears throat> and I am the regional manager for the Springfield office. Um, and I'll turn it over to Ben for his introduction. Thank you, Landon. Yep, so again, my name is Ben Moffitt. Thank you guys for the introduction today. And thank you for having us. Um, so I, I haven't been with the division quite as long as Landon. I have four years of service here. Um, prior to that, I'm a born and raised Vermonter. Um, and I was doing engineering work in the mechanical, electrical, uh, plumbing field uh, for seven years prior to coming here. Again, like Landon said, um, you know, hemp and the processing of it and the growing of it and how that interfaces with public buildings in the state uh, is very complicated um, and, and somewhat convoluted at times. And so um, having a couple experts, subject matter experts, is uh, pretty important for the division as a whole. Um, recently, I became the regional manager for the Barry office. So uh, DFS and Landon's going to touch a little bit on this, but we have uh, basically four districts in the state. Um, one up in the northwest corner, one in the northeast corner in the central Vermont area, which is what I cover, and then two in the southern portion, one in Rutland and one in Springfield. Awesome. So the Division of Fire Safety, I just want to give you a brief overview of who we are. We do fall under DPS, public safety. Um, we uh, encompass quite a bit in our small division. Um, the State Fire Academy, um, the state USAR team, the state HAZMAT team, the arson and explosives investigation team, um, and we also sit as uh, branch representatives and partners for the State Emergency Operations Center on a very regular basis. Um, so those are some of our additional duties along with new construction, uh, existing building inspections, uh, follow up on life safety hazards, um, and all of the hazardous materials um, storage for federal tier two reporting also come through the Division of Fire Safety. So uh, we, we are small, but we have um, a lot of uh, jobs and titles. Thanks. So this is also going to be me. Um, what we regulate, so 20 BSA 2730 uh, defines what a public building is, and that gives us our guidance in regards to what we have jurisdiction over and um, allows us to enforce our rules that through our rulemaking process. Um, if you'll click on the next couple, that'd be great. Some things that are typically not in our purview and we do not have jurisdiction over are buildings uh, that are single family owner occupied dwellings, certain agricultural buildings, and um, mercantile occupancies on farms that sell products that are principally produced on the farms themselves. Those would be examples of things we don't have jurisdiction over. Um, and it's easier to present it this way than it is to say what we do have jurisdiction over. Um, uh, the definition, if you'll go to the, the remainder of the slide, the, um, our state statute was actually modified with working with the Department of Ag um, when the hemp, bills were, hemp bill was introduced. And what that did was gave us jurisdiction over some hazardous processes that happened um, during the processing of hemp. Um, so uh, you'll see that there was a change or I, there was a, an addition uh, that if two or more people are conducting this hazardous operation of extraction, um, we would have jurisdiction no matter where that operation happened, whether it happened on a farm or in somebody's um, shed or in a garage. 
Um, but what I did do was leave the ability for a single individual to be able to do that on their own property and not trigger our oversight. So um, very much staying with uh, the Vermont way. Um, changes have been made, um, like I said, uh, during the, um, the introduction of the hemp law, uh, uh, hemp bill. And thank you, Stephanie, for your help in writing that section, um, because it was, uh, it actually was the first time that our statute had uh, specifically been changed, I think, in over 20 years. Uh, ben, you're up. So the Division of Fire Safety, we uh, have the authority under our rules to promulgate, or under our statutes, rather, to promulgate rules. Um, and in the state, we adopt some, um, I might be off of my number, 292 reference standards that we adopt through reference or either direct adoption. Um, so I'm just going to name a few of them here for you. Um, again, here's our rules. Um, so we adopt standards in entirety, and then we modify certain sections that we want to change. Um, again, this is done through a legislative rulemaking process similar to what uh, AG does. Um, so NFPA 1 is our fire code. That's kind of our all-encompassing um, uh, fire safety code that kind of regulates uh, anything that you might be doing in a public building in the state. Um, 101 is more specific to life safety, whereas 1 is more specific to fire safety, if that delineation makes uh, sense to you. Um, the International Building Code, so we also regulate building construction in addition to fire codes uh, here in Vermont. Um, the Plumbing Code, so one thing you'll know, and I think we talk about it potentially later on, is we not only enforce building and fire codes, we also house the electrical and the plumbing inspection for the state. So we house all the electrical inspectors and all the plumbing inspectors for public buildings under the division. Um, a big thing that we also uh, are tasked with is accessibility. Um, so we deal with all of the accessible standards that are promulgated by the Department of Justice. Uh, in this case, they're a little behind the times with the 2010 ADA standards. Um, and we also promulgate rules pursuant to accessible design in public buildings. So your bathrooms, your handrails, your ramps, all that kind of stuff is covered. Um, again, 292 standards, these are some of the big ones that come into play when we're talking about hemp. Um, NFPA 30, flammable liquids, regulate storage, use, and handling of all flammable liquids. Um, 70, again, I touched on, we enforce electrical codes through our state electrical inspectors. So uh, NFPA 70 is the National Electrical Code, or the NEC. Um, and 36, solvent extraction. And 90A, 90B talks about building mechanical ventilation. Um, and 90B specifically, once we start talking about ventilating hazardous type favors, um, which can be found in the hemp extraction world. Can you leave those up for a minute? Sure. So how did we get here um, as a division of fire safety? So I mentioned a few of our um, secondary tasks or jobs that we do. Um, and even prior to hemp um, build, coming about and, and starting to become uh, a business um, in Vermont, um, we had been involved in um, the extraction process and growing process more on the illicit side of the world, um, you know, with items such as butane, honey ash, um, or people making and extracting products in their home and having accidents. Um, so we saw uh, a need um, to better educate ourselves so that we could educate the public in regards to the hazards associated with those processes. So our education in regards to um, the big picture of this started a long time ago. Um, and it definitely helped facilitate us working into the hemp industry um, where it was more of a regulated and legal market. Um, it definitely gave us a, a background and a better understanding of all the processes that come along with um, uh, commercial sales and processing of, of uh, botanicals. And you'll see, um, we don't call and differentiate very often in any of our codes, um, hemp and marijuana. We, they're synonymous in our laws, and we typically cover them when we talk in broad spectrums as botanicals. Um, so that it's a, a more wide-reaching item. You know, not, does, not only does it cover marijuana and hemp, but it also covers lavender and um, 
um, you know, other things that can be extracted from plant matter. Thanks, Ben. So fire safety permitting process for hemp. So we wanted to give you guys a brief overview um, of how the permitting process works and why we have a permitting process. Obviously we have a permitting process because there can be some hazards that are associated with some of the hazardous materials and processes that are utilized during the extraction. But believe it or not, it's actually a lot wider ranging than that. It's not just extraction. Um, it's the secondary um, processing of the product it's the large um, occupancy loads that it takes to process material such as flour. Um, you know, it's um, the sales in mercantile environments. Um, we typically are involved in almost every aspect in some way of um, the sale, the production, the growing, the extraction, the secondary cooking uh, or processing of um, the product. Um, but the process, is, the process for us is typically always the same. So we're gonna go through that so you'll have a better understanding. We have four regional offices, um, Springfield, Barrie, Rutland, and Williston at this time. And um, contact is made typically from a, a customer that's interested in this process or starting a business. <clears throat> Next. So we'll have a, we'll schedule a preliminary meeting depending on the scope or the process that they want to do. And I'm gonna use extraction for this method because it seems like um, one of the, the ones that um, is the most time consuming for us, not for our customers, but for us. Um, we ask that they get an engineer of record because there's a lot of processes that they have that take a lot of specific engineering and review. And a lot of the equipment that they utilize is not UL listed. Um, and it wasn't designed for the product or the process that they're using it for. Um, so we'll have a meeting, DFS personnel, which is us, um, will provide them um, what information we're gonna need to review based off of what they tell us their processes will be. Um, the engineering documents are developed and submitted and, uh, for processing by the Assistant State Fire Marshal and Plan Reviewer. And that's where Ben and I typically will get involved and assist one of the plan review staff from the Division of Fire Safety in the review of the process um, because it can be very complex. And as you'll see, it can be very time consuming on our end. Um, go ahead. Once the review is complete, a permit is issued uh, and the applicant may begin construction or fit up of the proposed facility. The reason um, we, we put this slide or uh, this terminology up there specifically is um, there's a drastic difference in um, value um, and processing um, that's associated between hemp and marijuana production. Um, and as as this industry does move forward for you, you're gonna see the drastic differences in the way that the plant is taken care of, where it's grown, how it's treated in its processing, how it's packaged for sale. It's all gonna be drastically different than what the hemp or CBD industry is. And, um, and for us, it's, this, it's the same way. Plants being grown outside won't be grown outside anymore. They'll be brought inside of buildings because they're that much more valuable typically. Um, and it also helps protect the plant from some of those funguses um, so they don't have to use so many fungicides, herbicides, and pesticides. Um, and the last but not least, we do inspect these processes uh, throughout the construction of new buildings and the fit-ups of existing buildings as they are being um, renovated. Um, something that we learned during, um, for over the last two and a half years roughly, is uh, a lot of the old stock buildings that had been available for hemp production in Vermont um, may not have been the perfect fit for the industry. Um, and sometimes that can add um, barriers to the customer because those buildings just weren't built or designed for what they needed them for. Um, something that we um, are preparing for and um, we hope to see is that we see more new construction that is specifically designed for the industry. Um, and we have seen some uh, for the hemp industry um, to the, at this point. 
think you're up, Ben. Oh, this is last. This is me. Uh, the final inspection is completed. We do grant occupancy certificates and um, uh, operations certificates, uh, operating permits. Uh, once we get through the permitting and review process and our inspections are completed. The reason this is important is um, some of the processes are um, hazardous and uh, what we've learned over the last few years, even with the hemp industry, is um, the industry changes pretty drastically and pretty quickly. And uh, Vermonters are ingenious, absolutely ingenious. And they will find lots of ways to make things easier or more practical for themselves, but sometimes inadvertently that creates risk. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you take a machine um, that is designed to um, heat up uh, an extractive product that may have a hydrocarbon in it, um, but you put that next to an open flame, obviously you're going to introduce a combustible um, material to that environment and it can create a lot of risk and hazard. Um, and we've, we've learned that. Um, we really need to make it clear to our customers and the end users that once we grant this condition to operate, it has to stay that way until we reevaluate what you want to change. Um, because the scenario I just gave is a real life scenario. Um, you know, uh, working throughout our processes, um, you know, we've learned a lot and we've learned that um, we have to actually ask a lot more questions than people typically want to give answers to us for. Um, and I'll give you an, another example is, you know, uh, the breakdown of the medium to be able to extract it. You know, we actually found weed whackers being used inside of buildings. Um, we found milling machines that were designed for corn being used inside of buildings. Um, and we found a lot of specific hazards. And, you know, once we explained what the risk was and educated our customer in, in regards to those risks, uh, we were able to mitigate most of those issues. I think you're up, Ben. Yeah, so I just wanted to take a step back. Perhaps it wasn't clear. Um, we jumped into this slide. Um, the permitting process, typically anytime you are doing construction, addition, modification in what is defined as a public building under 20 VSA 2730, you would trigger requirements for permits. So I just wanted to back up. This is the process, but those are the triggers. Thank you, Ben. Can you repeat that, sir? Can you just repeat that last point? Yep. Yeah, so, so anytime you are doing construction, modification, fit up in an existing or a new building, if you're building a brand new building from the ground up, you would be required to obtain a construction permit if it is considered a public building under 20 BSA 2730. Um, so that kind of hopefully gives you the yeah, background. Because to me, it's really important the sequencing of this. Like right. When, when do people talk to you versus talk to us? And right. That should be part of our application versus. And and that is a very important part to us also because if you grant um, conditions to operate, we would love to be a, a component of that condition right. to operate. So um, you've received your permit um, from the Division of Fire Safety. Here is your permit to operate, um, or you know some sequence of events. Where we fit into that uh, in regards to your development, um, obviously that's probably a conversation for another day, and, um, but we definitely would love to be part of that. We're actually part of um, almost every association or agency's group that um, you've met with uh, so far that, that I could read on your agendas and your previous meeting notes. Um, we actually have a clause in almost every one of their rules that say, fire safety takes precedence over um, existing statute or existing rules or um, when there is a conflict, the Division of Fire Safety's uh, life safety requirements would take precedence. Um, and so I also want to clarify to go even further on that addition modification, anytime you install new fixed equipment would also trigger a permit. So fixed equipment would be something that's slaved off the building's power system. Um, or attached to its plumbing or any other type. So basically anything that doesn't plug into a wall would be considered fixed equipment. Um, and that would trigger it. And we have different permitting processes in place um, to, to address smaller scale projects versus a full new build project. So I just want to talk about time frame real quick. 
So the Division of Fire Safety has a goal of turning around every one of our permits within 30 days. And um, we have greater than 94%, I believe, um, uh, of reaching that goal. And typically that last few percentage of our projects um, are very complex in nature or have outstanding design issues that have to be provided to us. Uh, but we're very, very effective in regards to meeting reasonable time frames of turning permits around to our customers. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we conclude this presentation, we'll certainly make that, that point. But, you know, like Stephanie touched on, customer service to us is everything, and outreach is everything, and education is everything. And the more we can provide that to the design community and all of our players, it makes that process so much easier. I know when we started this, you know, we were getting hand-drawn sketches on paper of water heaters that were being, you know, it, it, runs, the, it runs the mill, um, but by the end of it, as we got into year two of this process, these people were coming to us with full design submissions, they knew exactly what was needed, and we were able to just process those permits through, so, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, some of the types of the processes that we've seen and, and how they interface with public buildings throughout the hemp program, um, you know, indoor growing, we certainly have seen that. Um, and, and we have not only dealt with the hemp side of things, we also deal with the medical um, marijuana side of things as well. And so we've been in some of those facilities. Um, but the big things for the indoor side, ventilation, um, irrigation, so obviously that involves plumbing, um, backfill prevention, all of that kind of stuff. And also the application of, of pesticides, fungicides, and fumicide, or, um, herbicide. herbicides, if they're being done in a building, can pose different hazards to the occupants. Um, so that's something that we have to look at ventilation and, and signage and all those sorts of things, as well as storage requirements. Um, we've seen drying, um, a lot of it. We've seen some large industrial drying operations inside of buildings. Um, this also includes the trimming, processing um, of the stalks, flour, um, right on down the line, even the extraction of terpenes through the drying process using condensation and collection. And like Landon said, you know, Vermonters are ingenious and they will figure out how to get every part of that plant that they can legally obtain out of that plant. Um, again, extraction, this is a big one, um, the mechanical. Um, processing of it. We've seen uh, any number of various um, operations and processes. Obviously, the big thing on that is there is a tremendous amount of hazard. Um, you know, everyone's seen the stories of these uh, plants failing and blowing up, uh, hurting both fire safety personnel as well as the occupants. Um, Distillation, so, you know, I know Stephanie touched on the, the slang, if you will, across the industry, um, but the raw crude that typically comes out of the extraction process is then um, distilled further on down the line to, you know, ref to extract or refine certain cannabinoids. Um, analytics, so we also touch on the analytics because obviously, as we've discussed already, we would we would exert jurisdiction over a laboratory space. Um, and NFPA does have a standard that regulates labs specifically. Um, and then just the, the aspect of hazardous materials as Landon uh, touched on, we do here under fire safety have the state hazmat team um, and we do regulate uh, the storage and we administer the federal tier two uh, EPRC Community Right to Know Act. Uh, which requires people uh, housing or storing over certain quantities of chemicals to register with, with us and the EPA. So lessons learned. Um, so years, a few years ago when this process all started, you know, we, we wanted to try and figure out where we were having breakdowns and how we could make things not only easier for us, but especially for our customers. And one of the big things was um, insufficient supply of adequately, adequately qualified design professionals across the entire state. Um, not, obviously, the process on the legal side of things was new to this entire environment um, and actually to the whole Northeast um, at that time. So uh, having design professionals that had awareness and knowledge of this process and the hazards associated with it was non-existent. 
So out-of-state design professionals not licensed to perform uh, design services in Vermont. Uh, statu separate statute 26 VSA governors, governs professional licenses in the state of Vermont. And it says if you're doing design work in the state of Vermont, you have to be licensed in the state of Vermont. Um, so we actually, we're going to get into the uh, how we helped people at the next slide. Ben gets to say the nice stuff. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't leave it this way. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, so one thing, I just, if I can elaborate yeah. on that real quick, Landon, we were seeing a lot of design professionals come out of the Colorado world, if you will. So a lot of Midwest or Western states that had moved into the, the marijuana uh, legal aspect of tax and regulate were coming here, and these people were like, well, what do you mean? You have a stamp. You know, they're good to go. It's like, well, they have to be licensed in Vermont. So that's uh, a little bit more on that. Lack of UL listed equipment intended for specific usage in the industry. Uh, much of the equipment is modified lab equipment. So um, the best way for me to explain this, especially dealing with a customer, is you're taking a piece of lab equipment and you're using it for industrial use. Um, and I'll use hemp as an example because that's what we have the most experience in. Um, but they wanted to process equipment as quick and as efficiently as they possibly could because that made that meant more money. Um, and they were using a lot of equipment um, that just wasn't designed for that. And I believe even right this second, there's only two pieces of extraction equipment that are actually UL listed and approved. Um, but there are literally tens of thousands of homemade designed and engineered pieces of equipment that are used in the extraction process. Um, and we've seen it all. We have Germany we have, with that stuff from overseas, um, come in with yeah, we've had, CE listings. And, and um, the way that we've worked with that is, is to get design professionals involved. But I'll let Ben talk on that in a few. Uh, new technology and processes constantly evolving in the word proprietary. So in this world, you are going to learn to hear that word. You're going to hear that word a lot. We have a proprietary process, and we don't want to share that, or we do not want that information to become public record. Um, as, a, as a state AHJ or authority having jurisdiction, we had to learn to work with all of our customers to provide a level of support um, and to get enough information to be able to accomplish our jobs, but provide them with enough security for them to know that what they think is proprietary or what they want to keep their own is going to stay their own. Um, and that was hard in some cases. A lot of the industry did not want to share with us the way that they were going to do their processes. Um, and we really need to know, because if we don't know, we're not going to be able to identify the risks associated with it. Existing buildings being converted into industrial usage containing hazardous processes. Um, so I've touched on this. Um, we do have one of the oldest stocks of buildings in the entire country, uh, being in Vermont. Um, I think it's the third oldest statewide, uh, state by state. Um, that does not help when we typically reuse buildings or when buildings have multiple uses. And I believe the next line, if you'll click, talks about multiple uses and mixed use buildings. Um, you know, in our industry, there's a lot of processes that can't happen in the same buildings that are high-risk buildings. And I'll explain that is we're not going to want to put a daycare in the same building as a building that's going to have an extraction process happening within that building. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of our old buildings are cut up in ways to have multiple uses and multiple occupancies. So that does bring another level of uh, difficulty to the customer when they're picking out their buildings to utilize. Um, the good thing is, is we're typically involved early enough in their process that we can discuss these risks and hazards um, and help guide them into a building that's going to work best for them with the least amount of restrictions. Go ahead. Scale of operation varies tremendously. Um, and what I mean by this is a lot of our customers working through this, um, the extraction side of hemp or even the storage of dried product or that they wanted to store long term, um, there was a great need to expand very, very quickly for some. And um, a lot of the industry wasn't prepared for that growth of scale. Um, and it was something that definitely caught us off guard 
Um, and it worked for some and it didn't work for others, but the, the scale of, of increasing the scale of their operations was something that we didn't realize would happen so quickly. Um, especially, you know, we would issue a permit and then uh, get a phone call very soon after that saying we'd like to amend that permit because we want to do this now. Um, and that builds into the new technology. Um, we figured out a different way that we, our customers would reach out to us and say we figured out a different way that we'd like to you to extract this process, uh, product. Um, and that would definitely add some uh, complications in some cases. Complaints, specifically odors. Um, so believe it or not, um, the odor of processing was our number one complaint um, that we received. Uh, and really all we can do at that point is make referrals to uh, air quality or, or to another state agency. Um, but overall, um, I really did expect to have um, some of the more common things uh, that we had noticed such as disposal of biomass material uh, in dumpsters or something along those lines. But the reality was our number one complaint was the odor from the buildings that were processing it. I think that's one more. Yeah, yep. so on the, the disposal of biomass. Um, the reason that this is uh, risky or uh, something that is on our radar is almost all of the processes that are utilized in the initial extraction leave some form of hydrocarbon or solvent in the plant-based material. And unless that small amount is removed, that material is highly flammable. Um, so if this ends up in a dumpster um, and a kid goes by that dumpster or, or an individual goes by that dumpster and thinks they hit the jackpot of all jackpots, um, you know, so we we absolutely have had to address it, and you know, I we're educators uh, way before we're an enforcement agency, um, so we utilize that opportunity to educate and talk about scenarios just like I just did, um, um, and I call it land and labs. I actually took a sample out of that dumpster, and I was at the facility with the fire department. We went to a safe location with the fire extinguisher, and I showed them how combustible that material was. Um, so, um, it definitely uh, is one of the things that we want to make sure we uh, address in your end of the process. A uh, complicated review process based on uh, project complexities. The typical review for Ben and I was about 40 to 60 man hours uh, of our time to review a process. Um, and that's got with information going back and forth between us and the design professionals that represent the owners of these facilities. Um, so it, it's very, very time consuming and labor intensive on our end. You're up. So some of the ways we, you know, obviously we saw the problems and, you know, we had to, to some extent, adapt on the fly. Um, so this slide specifically will talk about some of the, the stuff we've done because there are only two of us and, and it was coming at us, especially the first year um, when, when it became legal and people were just, I mean, every field was, was covered, um, if you will, in hemp and, and, you know, people were like, well, we got to get this out of the field. What do we do? We need to process it. And it was just coming in. So, you know, Landon and I seized the opportunity to really... Um, you know, work with Stephanie over at Agriculture, the, the relationship with, with our two departments has been phenomenal. Um, and, you know, that, that was a good first step to kind of bridge that, that regulatory guys, you know, do you guys cover this? Do we cover this? And there was a lot of unknowns initially. Um, and, I, and I hope that through this process, we can alleviate some of that moving forward. Um, you know, we've provided a lot of training to our fire marshals um you know both our field-based staff and our plan review staff so we we actually have fire marshals that are assigned to reviewing permits and and plans specifically so um you know getting them up to speed was huge um we've done interagency training on the law enforcement side um, we've actually trained with uh, the state police both the fire and explosion investigation unit uh, and the clandestine lab team over there um, just for first responder safety uh, in some of these operations. Um, we have, so Landon and I both sit on um, Build Safe Vermont, which is the International Code Council's Vermont chapter. 
Um, and through them, we worked to um, get Steve Thomas. I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard that name. If you haven't, he's an excellent uh, resource. Uh, and he's out of Colorado. Um, and he was big in the development of their industry on the code, fire safety, building safety side of things. So we set up through the Vermont chapter to, to bring him here and provide a presentation for engineers, architects, and anyone else who wanted to sign on. Um, again, uh, you know, more outreach on the national level as a state and as a division. We've actually, NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association, um, is actually looking at uh, cannabis, hemp, and the extraction processes. Um, and we as a division recently, uh, they were looking for feedback on starting a actual hemp, or cannabis should I say, standard specific to the industry. And we've, uh, we offered a letter of support for that um, from the state level. Um, uh, we also work with the ICC, which I said before is the International Code Council. Landon and I uh, both sit on the Northeast Regional Coalition um, for the ICC, so we are voting members uh, at the national level for code adoption and code changes, um, which has been a great opportunity for us as a state of Vermont to really uh, formulate and drive the model codes in a way that is uh, predictable for us. Um, and we've also, I know Landon's worked with UVM Extension um, to provide outreach more specific to the growers and the processors. Um, and we've attended a number of the agency's uh, outreach programs as well to answer questions for folks. So, you know, this is, again, the biggest thing for us is educating people so that they can be aware of the requirements, the processes, and, and get through the, the regulatory hurdles. So again, this has been high level. Um, I'll let Landon take yeah. it from here. And yeah, no, again, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to come here today and speak to you all. Um, you know, our, like I mentioned, our goal is to educate way before we ever have to use enforcement tools. And we use that opportunity to the best of our ability. Um, but we, that something that goes along with our, us being educators is this industry um, is so new and changes so quickly um, that we've become permanent students. Um, and what we've um, done for the Division of Fire Safety is um, embrace that and, and get as much education as we possibly can and then pass it on to the other members of the Division of Fire Safety so that when this does ramp up and it does increase in regards to the needs and our involvement, we should be uh, ready and something that's helped us along that way is um, there will be very few changes uh, for us between the hemp industry world and the legal sales of recreational marijuana world other than the increase in the types of facilities um, that would sell process grow um, the end product Wow that's great any questions for Ben and Landon? I have a I have a quick question. You opened this up by saying some statutory changes need to be made as related to hemp and agricultural buildings. I mean, this is a commercial product and statute, not an agricultural product and statute. I would imagine that that means there wouldn't need to be any further statutory changes for you um, to, if it specifically mentions hemp, but we're not doing hemp. Yeah. I was curious, but I guess as I'm thinking through my question. Like, that was that was going to be our question to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, if you're not going to allow the product to be called agricultural. Well, that's what it's called in our authorizing legislation at this, at this time. It's, it's a commercial product, not an agricultural product. And we read that. Yeah. Um, and it was brought to our attention um, uh, through another agency. Um, what that would mean for us is, I don't believe there would be a statutory change requirement. What it would mean for us is that any building, whether um, it's a grow, um, uh, a grow structure, let's call them, because there could be lots of different types, has natural light or non-natural light, it would mean that in some way we would be able to retain jurisdiction in that building. Um, if that's not the intent, 
of the, the statute, then I would say a, regul uh, a regulatory change should happen. But if that is the intent, um, then that's what the conclusion would be, is we would have jurisdiction over anywhere it's grown, sold, processed, um, extracted, distilled, uh, cooked, baked, um, trimmed, disposed of. <laughs> but um, it, that was our major question, honestly, was um, it does create some confusion between 20 BSA um, and the current statute at, or the act at hand um, in regards to we define agricultural buildings as places that grow with less than six full-time employees or 12 or the equivalent of 12 part-time employees, I believe. Yes. Um, 20, no more than 26 weeks per year. No more than 26 weeks per year. So our statute and our definition in regards to what is agricultural is very, very specific. But from what we understand, um, this bill would not allow that pr that product to be called agricultural. So just on this point, though, if an agricultural structure that is outside of your jurisdiction brings solvent extraction into it, it's outside of your jurisdiction still? No. Okay. That would be a change of use, and it would definitely yeah. be within our jurisdiction. Okay. Um, I'm more talking along the lines of somewhere where the plant is uh, grown through all phases of its life. Um, and I'll, you know, an example of that is we had an old Napa building that was converted into a nursery. Uh, you know, it's, we've seen lots of reuse of structures, but, and that became a public building once that happened. So not to confuse the matter, <laughs> but as statutes sometimes do, if there was only one person doing said extraction in that agricultural building, they would be excluded. Yeah, okay. And then it, it can get even a little bit more complicated if we argue, well, what's the definition of employment? Yeah, gotcha. So you get a lot of these family operations, well, we, we right. trade a place to stay, we're, we're not, he's not employed. And so it, you know. Again, education goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a lot, like, you know, a lot of times, once you educate people or what the hazards are, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we, we don't want to have something unsafe or pre present an unsafe situation. So. Carrie, do you want to make a Sure, unless Steph has one for this topic. Okay. I do. Um, is it safe to say that, because you guys are involved in the medical marijuana dispensary and permitting for that, based on the current designation not being farming, this would be lateral. It's, just, it's similar. You would treat the building similarly. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But I don't I don't think we want to see us have to have a sprinkler system in a greenhouse. So yeah. So um, believe it or not, um, the in International Building Code is going to be addressing this, I believe, in the 2021 code. It's going to define that plants that are grown in non-natural light buildings should be classified a little differently than, than plants that are grown in natural light buildings. Um, so I, I think that we're well in place to not have that scenario ever come up unless it's like really, 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 really big. Um, yeah. or they introduce something a little different that creates a hazard. Um, you know, I want to give you, I do want to give you an example of a hazard that is created in, an, in most grow facilities now is they produce um, carbon dioxide for the plants to grow and they usually use a hydrocarbon that's burnt in that environment to create that carbon dioxide. So um, they use pot burners, um, they hang them in the environment and um, they burn propane or natural gas and um, that that can create a hazard for us and it's something that we have identified and worked with some farms with uh, um, Reducing the risk associated with that I guess what I wanted to add sort of conceptually to this and Why uh, when Stephanie started talking about fire safety, I, I didn't understand it, but the hemp pro program was designed first as a consumer protection program and then Sort of secondly, to create a culture of compliance among the growers and processors. And the third component there was to protect the long brand. And all that effort and all that work could be undone by one headline or two headlines of the facility burning down or blowing up or 
impact in the neighborhood adversely in that way. So when these conversations were occurring, we were like, oh yeah, we need to change the statute to make sure that fire safety is involved in these processing facilities. Yes, and um, we have been headline free. Um, and I'm going to knock yeah, on wood. There you go. Um, that's the success. In it, and that's how we gauge our success is um, when we are not in the paper. And that's. People aren't getting hurt. And people, yeah. People and then property are our goals um, for the Division of Fire Safety. Uh, the preservation of life is our ultimate goal. Um, we are a prevention organization. So we're supposed to look to see what the risks can be and reduce those risks through our codes and standards um, and, and through our educational practices and processes. So that's all I have. Thank you for listening to me rant. <laughs> I, I have a question. Just, yeah. um, I assume that you're fee supported um, and I'm just curious for these complex projects that take 40 to 60 hours of review. Yep. Um, what is it kind of just an example? So, so I can give you our, our fee base is very easy. Um, it's Point, it's eight dollars per one thousand dollars of valuation of construction, so it's very affordable. Um, it's you repeat that, so yeah, it's eight dollars per one thousand dollars of valuation of the project. Okay. So total construction value, eight dollars yeah. per thousand. Yeah. So and flat, um, it's a flat fee, and then yeah. we also there's a there's a maximum fee, if you will, which. Most of our, our smaller hemp operations don't ever reach that threshold, um, but there is a maximum amount. Yes, we have a very, very affordable uh, fee bill and fee schedule, and it's kept simple on purpose. Um, something that we didn't touch on, but we should, is um, both of us do have other trades uh, that fall under the Division of Fire Safety. We um, encompass the electrical inspectors and plumbing inspectors of Vermont. Um, and they do have a separate fee scale, but again, it's um, uh, it's pretty itemized nominal. and it's pretty nominal. Um, just one more, just digging in, sorry. Sure. Yeah. Uh, just digging into this um, kind of sequencing of, of when you all should be involved versus our approval process. Um, because we are required to kind of try to limit the barriers to entry for small cultivators particularly. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't want them to pay unnecessary fees um, for projects that aren't going to proceed because they can't meet the, the code. Um, so I'm just trying to think what you would like to see from us as far as when, what we should require prior to someone seeking an application. This is probably a much longer conversation that we should have. Um, yeah. Maybe it's not appropriate to do it right now. We're running a little short on time, but uh, maybe just a high, high level thought on that. So, yeah, no, I, uh, I agree that is going to be a difficult conversation, um, and we don't want that to happen either. I mean, that the intent is for us, for somebody that submits uh, information and documentation to us to get their permit from us. Um, I'm not sure how your layout is going to look in regards to people's approach to your different licenses. And, um, and I can say that it would be very easily streamlined and probably non-confrontational for either one of us for almost all of the practices and licenses you'll have except for uh, extraction or distillates and um, um, probably some storage uh, depending on how it's what's required and I say that only because of this the other occupancies are less complex most buildings can meet the requirements very very easily with small changes um, the ones that I did mention are, um, they could not be approved for us or they could not want to have to take the steps to be approved from us. And that's where I see that breakdown. And, and I want to use the hemp industry as an example. We, we had so many processors that came to us, hired engineers, bought specific pieces of equipment, and then um, there was changes in the market or environment or bit availability of product, and they didn't move forward with their process. And um, I wouldn't want to see uh, a barrier from either one of us as part of their choice to not move forward. Yeah. So I'll, I'd be more than happy to 
have that discussion. Yeah, and I think some education, even in our application process, mm -hmm. could be very helpful for folks that are thinking about a license. Right, and that's and historically that's kind of how we've handled it with with Stephanie. You know, because they're they're the first contact typically. You know, when they're coming to get registered as a grower or processor, and and I think that works pretty well. I mean, we and and to touch on Landon's point, I, personally, I don't think I've ever denied a permit application for a building. I think we've, we've found a way to um, meet the intent of the code through prevention and other measures uh, in that building to make it work. So there are situations, sure, but for the most part, it's it's doable. Great. Mm -hmm. And you're not being paid by the hour for these guys, so you get paid by the valuation, so there's might we can mm -hmm. work with these folks, and it's mm -hmm. not going to cost them more money. Just real quick, we've used that to our advantage. It takes us 40 to 60 hours, but we incorporate other employees and division staff members so that it's not just a permitting process, it's an educational process and something that we can use to our benefit also. We're, uh, we have to use our time very, very wisely. It's limited. Any other questions? Yeah, I got one question. It's been a while since I've been in the NFPA code world um, from the solvent. I can't remember which, which code it was for solvent, what the number was. So NFPA 1 Chapter 65 is going to be the Hazardous Materials Code, okay. and NFPA 400 will cover all hazardous materials. NFPA 30 will be combustible and flammable liquids. Okay. And if we're talking gaseous, there's a, a separate standard yeah. under right. NFPA 55, but it's also under NFPA 1. I was, I was just going to say, I, I know you had mentioned that NFPA is potentially considering doing something that's a little bit more streamlined for this industry mm -hmm. moving forward, but I'd imagine all the traditional solvent extraction methods that are employed in this industry and other at a larger scale in the agricultural manufacturing industry yep. um, are kind of have some language built into what they're doing in, in those portions of the NFPA. Absolutely. We actually have specific language today, yeah, okay. um, and it's phenomenal. It's NFPA one chapter thirty eight. Yeah, that's what I saw. I was uh, just trying to remember what it was. And that's in the two thousand eighteen edition of one. So you know, again, the, the codes they're they're more reactionary, you know, and again, the industry is so new, and that's why NFPA is trying to you know develop the a, a formal put together a technical committee because any time a national standards develop, there's a technical committee that is industry reps and, and all sorts of people involved um, right. to put an actual to take 38 and give it its own uh, standard if you will so yeah and that's really great to hear I think I told you I, I um, have experience in the, the solvent perspective of mm -hmm. NFBA and the combustible dust perspective of that yeah, yeah. from prior prior work so thank you absolutely thank you well thanks for being here um, obviously we have you know more work to do with you all um, and so you know we'll just continue the conversation but thank you for this kind of introduction to this and making sure that we and everyone who's watching kind of knows what the expectation is sure anytime thank you thank you Ray. i know you kind of juggled some stuff to be here both in person today so thank you no problem it's, it's very important to us both we've spent a considerable amount of time working with the industry with our partner agencies and with each other um, so it it's, uh, it is important to us all. Yeah. Um, so next on our agenda, we have another public comment period. Um, we'll handle it the exact same way as we have been. If you, if you join through the link um, and you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hands. Uh, we'll then move to the folks on the phone after the people with the link have had an opportunity. Um, I see, is that it? Karen? Karen, Karen Connolly. Karen you can, I think you can unmute yourself. Yes. Hi, um, Karen Connolly. I do have one question. Um, it was mentioned that you handle lab analysis. So is that coordinated with the Vermont hemp program because they are working to certify the labs? So what is the coordination there? So we have clearly identified barriers of what our responsibilities are, and they're very different. Our, the Division of Fire Safety's responsibilities are for the equipment, how it's installed, and the hazardous materials that are utilized. And, the, and that's where our process would stop. 
and the certification process would pick up um, in regards to how those tests are conducted. And I don't want to speak for anybody else, but um, how the tests are conducted, the standards they're conducted to, and the parameters they're conducted within, I believe, would summarize it. All right, thank you. Did I miss anything? So do you mean that you handle the the um, the testing or they do? That wasn't clear. Uh, I, the the fire this is Stephanie from the Agency of Agriculture. The fire safety division will will evaluate the envelope, whereas the agency's hemp okay. certification program handles the processes and the standards to which those processes are conducted. So does that make sense? So it's, it's a, we both have jurisdiction over this, <laughs> but just for different things. Okay, that is clar that's a clarifying. Okay, thank great. you. Thank you, Karen. Thank, thank you. Um, anyone else who joined through the link, uh, if you'd like to just raise your virtual hand, if you'd like to make a public comment. Um, all right, it looks like we have maybe one, oh, uh, Loretta. I, I'm, very, I'm very interested in something that I just purchased at my uh, dispensary that's called Nano Emotion. And I was wondering if you have anything that you could uh, tell me about it. it. What it does is it increases the processing of how the uh, cannabinoids and everything affect you instead of so it's digestion is supposed to take 15 minutes instead of 90 minutes. So the thing is Nano Emotion that I'm uh, interested in finding more about. Uh, Loretta, um, maybe if you could send an email um, to someone at the Agency of Agriculture or someone. It, this really isn't meant to be a question and answer session um, with our witnesses. It's really just kind of a open comment, public comment um, for the board to hear the concerns of members of the public. Um, okay, so okay, I understand. Thank you, Mr. Pepper. It's just that this process is going on in Vermont. And I just wanted to um, find out if there was any, you know, chemical processing. But I'll, I'll go ahead and send an email. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Loretta. Um, anyone else who's uh, joined by the link? Um, it looks like we maybe have one or two people that have joined by the phone. If you, if you would like to make a public comment, please hit star six to unmute yourself. And we have one person who's joined us live. Would you like to make a public comment? No. no. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that uh, can conclude our public comment. Um, next on our agenda is a lunch break. Um, so we're going to take a lunch break. We'll be back at uh, 1 o'clock to hear from Bia Diagnostics um, and uh, Korea Botanicals. So uh, we can take a break. Um, Kyle, would you mind pausing the recording? So we are back, it's one o'clock. Our next witness today is Tom Grace and uh, Carla Farmer. Farmer. Um, and they're here from uh, Via Diagnostics. Uh, the board went and visited the lab, an uh, incredibly impressive operation, um, and a great kind of Vermont story too. So I won't waste any more time, but we would like to just hear um, just a little bit about your background and some of the challenges and potential opportunities that we have in the realm of testing um, when we come to uh, kind of a tax and regulated adult use market. Sure. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Luke Emerson Mason. Here's he's the uh, lab director. Um, Carly, as you were uh, last week or the week before, and then Adam Bouchard here, um, he's our sales uh, marketing director. So all of us are here and um, just to give you some background about BIA Diagnostics, BIA is the Irish word for food. Uh, it also happens to be the BIA Bureau in Ireland is the FDA of Ireland. We have no association with them, but we thought BIA would be a good name for our company since I was born in Ireland and uh, an immigrant to the US, but grew up here. And uh, just to acknowledge, um, you know, uh, also, so it can, re can be also an acronym for biointeractive analysis, which is 
pretty much what we're doing with most of our methods here at the laboratory. So uh, in 2006, my daughter, myself, and my wife decided that, um, well, I decided that uh, we could open up a laboratory uh, because there was a need for allergen testing in foods. Um, back then, there was only one laboratory in the United States that was doing this testing, and I was familiar with the market because I'd worked with biotech and several other companies in Europe on the food testing market in North, in North America. <clears throat> and I saw that there was a need for rapid turnaround time testing and also um, a need for validation of methods. Uh, companies, uh, food companies did not want to spend a lot of energy and time and their, mar their margins were very small to validate methods. So in order for um, these methods to be accepted by these uh, different manufacturers, uh, they should be vetted and validated with these food manufacturers matrices and be, I thought would be a good match for that. So uh, we put our pennies together in 2007. Uh, we opened up a laboratory um, that we literally built with our own hands. Uh, we bought, got stuff from the University of Vermont, uh, St. Michael's College, eBay, et cetera, and um, opened up the laboratory. And almost from the very beginning, we were profitable, which was great. I, uh, I happen to know a lot of the people in the food industry and they utilized our services. But there was also one aspect of that, uh, which I thought was important, was the fact that some of the methods that were available commercially for detecting food allergens weren't really designed for processed foods. And since we only saw processed foods, I decided that I would figure out a way to make my own method for detecting these, these uh, specific allergens. So I found a company in uh, Oregon who was willing to work with me and we developed antibodies specific for egg, peanut, milk, uh, soy, et cetera, that could detect these highly processed proteins. Um, and very quickly we developed that into um, a company called Illusion Technologies and developed test kits that we use in-house today, but also uh, we distributed to companies around the world. And uh, we developed a rapid five minute, uh, actually about a 10 minute uh, method, like a pregnancy test that people could use, that companies could use in their own manufacturing facilities for detecting these allergens part of their quality control program. Uh, and about six years ago, we ended up selling that part of our company, Illusion Technologies to 3M. And uh, now they distribute that product around the world. And we still manufacture these test kits, uh, but 3M owns the technology. And about the same time, about five, six years ago, uh, we noticed that there was a need in Vermont to do uh, hemp testing. Hemp uh, CBD was becoming a, um, a new thing in the market, and uh, Vermont looked like it was going to be producing, uh, farmers were going to start making um, crops of hemp, and we saw that there were really no good laboratories in Vermont. There were a few in Massachusetts and Maine, but uh, none in Vermont that really could um, do that type of testing, the quality control testing necessary for that market. So with some of the money that we had gained from the Aleutian technology sales, we decided to invest it in a brand new hemp testing laboratory, chemistry lab. And uh, we fit it up with um, extra space that we had here in our laboratory area. And uh, today we have the state of the art, probably technology of, and the envy probably of other laboratories around for the quality that we have uh, for uh, hemp and products testing. <clears throat> so that's where we are now. Uh, one of the things that we try to do for our employees is we also offer great benefits and uh, not only livable salaries plus um, healthcare benefits where nothing is out of pocket for them, educational <laughs> benefits for them as well. And uh, to start off, they get a five week vacation um, yearly. Uh, we're also off for, um, for Christmas, the Christmas holiday from uh, Christmas Eve to January 1st, 2nd, and, uh, and also the state holidays as well. So, um, 
our employees are usually uh, pretty happy with what we provide them, I hope, anyway. And um, uh, I try to give them uh, an environment because we're only as good as they are. I mean, we all know that, that, that uh, if we treat them right, they will take care of the business that, that makes us survive. So uh, I think that's very, very important. Uh, so not only their financial needs, but their uh, social needs as well for their family and for uh, and also our environment. Um, you know, social environment, our 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 uh, collective um, uh, environment of um, of Kitten County, but Vermont as a whole. Um, so, Carly, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of testing? Sure. <laughs> does does anybody have any questions before I continue? Um, do we, we we can hit you with questions as they come up. I mean, uh, uh, this, you know? yeah. Well, why don't we just wait a little bit and because uh, I mean, I got a number of questions for you, but uh, why don't why don't you continue and we'll we'll add some questions towards the end. Sure. Um. So basically, our goal in um, the Cannabis Laboratory uh, is surrounded uh, around safety of product, right? So whether it's hemp, whether it's uh, high THC products, we're looking for um, contaminants, we're looking for potency, we're looking for microbials, um, and all of this right now is currently required by the state of Vermont already for hemp. Um, and I know that you're looking at that moving forward with can with other cannabis products, high THC. Um, and what we want to do is really allow, um, you know, trust in products. So that's, you know, taking our results to the customer or whoever's selling this product or making something out of it um, and allowing them to trust in this product that it's safe to, to give out to people and sell uh, and use themselves. So the four pillars that we were looking at is safety, trust, quality, and value. Because um, you know, without having uh, a safe product, there's no trust. And with the quality that that we can add, Vermont can add to these products gives uh, the customer um, the extra value that uh, they would be looking for and willing to pay for as long as it's safe. And uh, and is labeled properly. So that's our goal: is to create a safe, trusted, quality value product for the consumer, and for the grower, manufacturer, of course. Do you want to certification? You mentioned certification. Yeah, I was going to. Email. I was going to say, you know, it seems to me like what we heard earlier is that certification is one of the most costly ongoing costs that you have. Could you talk a little bit about the ISO certification and maybe the Vermont certification from the Agency of Agriculture that you did and what that means, what's entailed, and whether that, um, you know, why that's important? Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, you know, it's a third party certification, so it's an important step, I think, for any laboratory to have. Um, so people can have confidence in your results. Basically, it requires you to perform a, you know, a high amount of validation testing for your methods to satisfy these third party auditors that you're performing the analysis correctly and reporting results accurately. Um, so it is a very important system and we are ISO 17025 accredited currently for cannabinoids and we're accredited by the state of Vermont for uh, cannabinoids and moisture content testing. Uh, our ISO certification covers. Yeah, we are for our ISO accreditation. We are covered for both low and high THC cannabis products. So it covers hemp and marijuana, and we are moving along um, shortly with all the other methods. So heavy metals, residual solvents, pesticides, mycotoxins terpenes and microbials, hopefully within the next couple months for ISO and for the state. Um, but it is a big expense. You know, these validation materials 
are similar to calibrators. They're extremely expensive. You have to continuously run quality control checks, um, but it is in the name of you know consistent quality results. So I do think it's an important thing to have. So it's all about traceability so that and culpability so that we have a way to trace back to some original source certified reference material that shows that the results that we're putting out are accurate to uh, sp uh, specifications. So that's the thrust, the basics of ISO. But all the paperwork, all the traceability that we have to put into that and the time uh, for our own validation showing that we are capable or culpable and culpable for our results. And that's the, again, the idea behind ISO, uh, showing that whatever we're doing is repeatable and accurate. Um, and uh, also, we're very involved with AOAC, which is an organization that certifies methods for the food, pharmaceutical industry, and um, infant formula industry, et cetera. Uh, and we're involved with their committees on uh, hemp testing and cannabis testing, and uh, also their certification process for methods. So we have inputs on that and we're on their committees. And we will be attending that conference in uh, end of August in Boston, uh, which is the AOAC conference, annual conference there. And uh, last year we presented a paper that Carly had put together, I think two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. Uh, on uh, hemp testing, uh, which got an award from their organization. And uh, what we continue to do our research and put our uh, stuff together for uh, these uh, presentations and for the organization. Um, yeah. So, um, you oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, please go ahead. I, you, I think we're probably reading, reading from the same list. I gave you a <laughs> list of topics that I thought you might want to cover, and I, I have them up as yeah. well. You can ask the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> So what do you test for? And I heard uh, Luke mention a few things, um, but also what is the cost of this kind of full panel versus you know, potency? I mean, it, I know you probably have this up on your website, but I think it's probably helpful for us to hear just kind of a full panel test, how long it takes and what you test for. Can we take that breakdown? Sure, so <clears throat> like you said, um, a lot of this information is is found on our website. We are actually updating our website uh, as things continue to evolve and we offer uh, new tests. But um, the, the testing really ranges our, our microbial package, which includes total aerobic plate counts and yeast and mold. Uh, we do those combined for as little as, as $40. And uh, you know, our most common test, the cannabinoids, $75. But we do offer uh, full panels so let's say for, for flour, which would include cannabinoids, terpenes, heavy metals, pesticides, mycotoxins, and microbials, a total at a discount for 430, just to give you some examples. But we also offer both- $430. Yes. We also offer bulk discounts to customers. So if they're submitting 10 samples or more simultaneously, they also receive a 10% discount at that time. Uh, just to give you kind of a, a quick overview of how our pricing structure and again, you can find some of this material on our website, and uh, we are continually updating it as well. So the cannabinoids would be $75 per test, um, terpene $75, et cetera. Uh, and Tom, you're finished with everything else. I guess the um, we also do melatonin, uh, which did you mention that? I, think I, I had it. Yeah. And uh, we do mycotoxins, which again takes is a little bit more expensive, as well as uh, pesticides, which is a little bit more expensive, 195 but um, the cost of the instruments are very, very high. You know, we've invested over a million dollars in the instruments and set up the lab. Um, the cost of materials are very expensive also for um, calibration and create the standards that are used for these assays. Also, the time involved, personnel involved to do a prep it takes about um, 24 hours to run a single uh, cannabinoid sample from prep to finish. Um, and the margin, to be honest, are very, very low. Uh, so we really need to batch these samples together, run anywhere between 10, 20, 30 samples at a time in order to um, uh, defray the cost of um, running these methods. 
uh, if we ran one method, we would we would lose money on a single sample uh, on, on a method. So we have to batch it in order to make it uh, worthwhile uh, for us to do the analysis and defray the cost of the equipment and all the other uh, auxiliary costs that we deal with on a daily basis. Even getting rid of our waste material costs us a lot of money, you know, because we use uh, certain reagents that are semi-toxic and uh, to do the extraction process, we have to get rid of it through the solid waste district of Vermont of Chittenden County. And again, uh, there's a fee for that. So it all adds up. Uh, so that's why we have to batch it together. Um, we could probably right now do today, do yesterday we did 30 uh, uh, cannabis testing, ten, uh, cannabinoid testing uh, samples, right? Uh, 30 yesterday. So I think we talked about this earlier that we could probably do 60 per day uh, at our current uh, rate. If we got higher than that, we'd probably have to look at uh, employing another instrument and maybe expanding the lab a little bit, which we have extra space for. Well, I guess that was going to be one of one of my questions was capacity and recognizing that your uh, potential um, you know, entry into this high THC market, you know, as a business decision and what your, you know, I know that we've got a lot of things to do before you can make an informed business decision, but I wanted you to discuss potentially your interest in expanding capacity to, you know, to help folks that need to get their product tested um, from this emerging market perspective. Yeah, I mean, we have the capacity uh, to build into a, uh, the space that we have currently, there's another uh, probably, I don't know how many square feet, but right next door, uh, actually attached to the space we have now, we could probably move into and utilize that space as well. Um, it would take us probably two months to set up that space, but it wouldn't be that difficult to do that. And especially for determining THC CBD levels uh, using uh, HPLC uh, would be pretty quick. Uh, process to um, expand out and, and do extra testing, you know, 60, 80, 100 samples per day if we had to. <clears throat> we also have to train up our personnel, which takes about um, probably four to six weeks. Uh, we are rotating currently everybody through the uh, hemp lab, the cannabis lab currently, so everybody will be familiar and be able to run the equipment if necessary and the assays. Um, so that's happening currently. Um, Luke and Ryan currently are have been through the process and are now uh, certified to run these assays besides Carly and uh, Sydney. So uh, and then probably the next three or four months we'll have uh, two or three more people go through uh, training and certification to run uh, these assays. So uh, I see no problem expanding as long as the market is there. And again, it's a cost benefit analysis that we have to go through. But, uh, you know, as long as we have a volume, then we can justify the cost. Um, you said that you could, pro or that yesterday you processed 30 um, cannabinoid tests. Yes. How long does it take from the time that the sample sort of enters your door to the time that the testing is complete? What's that timeline look like? Um, so it depends on what is being required for testing. Um, if we're talking about just cannabinoids themselves, it takes us, um, and, and as well as thinking more about batching, right? So if we have a batch of 30, it's going to take a lot longer to process those than just one. Um, so there's a lot of variables there, but if we're just talking about one sample. Um, you could probably get it running that same day processed, uh, run that overnight, and then we could analyze the results the next day. But for 30? For 30, that takes a bit longer. Um, we could probably, depending on if we have more manpower or woman power in the, in the laboratory. Person power. Person power <laughs> uh, in the laboratory is that we could um, easily do a similar timeline, let's say. It's just, you just have to ramp up the amount of labor that's being put into it. So for two people, and we've done this before, where we, we would process with two people to get the samples into a format that the machine can handle. 
So what it involves is, is homogenizing the sample, weighing it out, and then uh, extracting it with a uh, solvent, putting it into a, a, a specific vial, and then putting it on the instrument, getting the instrument calibrated, all set up, and then running it. So you're talking uh, from start to finish, probably 48 hours. Uh, if you are, would you say that? Yeah. If you are uh, with with two people uh, doing the uh, prep work. Yeah. So that's just for cannabinoids. If we're talking about our longest assay, which would be uh, micro, that has to incubate over a five day period. So that's a much different story. Um, it's going to take us a similar amount of time to prep that sample, but the assay and testing itself is going to take much longer, more like a week. Yeah, but then you have heavy metals and terpenes and residual solvents, pesticides, microtoxins. Uh, they also take their own individual prep times as well. So if you want to do a full panel of analysis, you're talking probably, you know, four days excluding micro. Can you say that? Sure. Thank you. you know, uh, Tom and Carly and Luke, one thing that we are, of course, struggling with as a board is that we need to make accommodations for small cultivators to break down the barriers to entry. Um, and I, like, forgive my ignorance, but uh, you know, how do you have suggestions for us from a testing, um, you know, from the testing aspect? about how we can help our small cultivators not be overburdened by the testing aspect, which is a cornerstone of our, of our mission is to have consumer safety. You know, the, the four pillars that you listed are what we need, but we need to balance that against the fact that, uh, you know, it's not, for cultivators especially, this is not a terribly profitable business potentially. For the thousand, by small cultivators, we're, we're using the thousand square foot um, kind of marker. Um, and one thing that comes to mind, just bear with me, uh, is, you know, if you tested the soil, um, you know, do you need to continuously test the products that are grown in that soil, for instance, if there's no other, if there's, if there's no turnaround? And that's just one thought. But, uh, but please, if you have any thoughts on that, you know, this is kind of our, the question that we grapple with with every decision that we're going to have to make. I think we've tested soil before, haven't we? Yeah. We've tested soil before. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not. I'm not a farmer. I'm, I'm not an agriculturist. Uh, you know, my background is 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 cancer research, cell biology, pharmacology. Um, so a little bit different. Um, but uh, I would think that as long as they're not spraying stuff on the on the plant, uh, you should be fine as far as testing the soil for. Um, you know, contaminants, heavy metals, and uh, let's say, um, uh, you know, pesticides that might be in the soil. Uh, I think that would be uh, fine as long as the the, company, the, the farmer is not spraying his, his product with Roundup or something like that, which he would never do anyway. Um, but yeah. Um, I know, go ahead. I was going to say, I think what the state has developed for the hemp program is they've done a pretty good job of accommodating for these things. Whereas if you haven't been a, you know, an apple orchard, you don't have to test for heavy metals. If you're organic, you don't have to test for pesticides. I know one of the big burdens there became each different strain you grow, you have to do the complete test on each. So I don't think people really took that into consideration, you know, when they were planting, perhaps if they had four different varieties of hemp cultivars, they would have to do all these tests four different times. Um, you know, someone's growing indoors, it could be a little different. Certainly different varieties can, you know, uptake pesticides and heavy metals differently, but those aren't things you have to worry about so much in a controlled loop. You know, you might be able to minimize the amount of testing they do on a, you know, a grow, depending on how many different varieties they have for strains. We know that it has to be uh, amenable to the farmer, the processor, and the, you know, the consumer, and you know, for, also from a regulatory perspective. So it has to be has to work for everybody. Otherwise, it's not going to work for anybody. Um, so it has to work for us as well. Uh, but we want to we want to you know 
help the market any way we can because you know that's that's our our goal is to um, help the farmer and the producer the processor uh, as much as possible and uh, you know whatever we can do to help with that we'll we will do um, we're trying to figure out more efficient ways to do the processing here um, and you know we've been looking at it and have some ideas that maybe could speed things up and maybe make it a little bit more efficient. Uh, our, we've done that with our uh, allergen testing lab. We have become very, very efficient at processing up to 200 samples in a day. Um, and, you know, it just works like clockwork currently. And we're hoping to be able to apply, imply, apply those, those techniques, those ideas that we use for that into the uh, hemp lab, the cannabis lab. That's our, our goal. We can, you know, sort of streamline the extraction process, make it more efficient. Uh, that would definitely reduce our cost, but also uh, can pass that on to the um, uh, our customers. I got a I got a follow up. Well, I got a follow up to Peppers, to Chairman Peppers' um, question, and it's it's um, I guess it's a, a different way to ask <laughs> the same question. Um, um, first of all, I know I know that you guys are very conscious of your your prices, and you know those are oriented to make sure that all folks um, that are interested in pursuing different types of testing um, can afford it and are not immediately um, mooted out of the conversation because they can't afford it. And um, I know I'm thankful for that. Um, so you know, uh, bouncing off of what. Uh, Chairman Pepper said about balancing the small cultivator interest, making breaking down barriers, um, and looking at testing and looking at the cost associated with testing. I would imagine that there's some kind of baseline or litmus test where there's certain there's certain elements of testing from an environmental contaminant perspective, from a consumer protection perspective, are absolutely necessary um, to conduct for any product that comes in um, to your lab. But I'm sure that there's also additional testing that might be done now, might not be done now, might be required now, might not be required now, uh, that could be considered you know, additional marketing material for folks that can afford it um, and that want to figure out ways to differentiate their product. And I guess you know, terpenes, other cannabinoid percentages that might be present in a certain strain or a certain product immediately come to mind. But, but from your perspective, where is that bright line? Where's a, if, if there is one, I guess, where's a good place for us to kind of uh, set a solid regulatory testing foundation and allow, you know, folks that have the capital to come in and, and differentiate their product? Well, I think the terpenes are a good, good example um, that I don't think have um, any negative impact on the consumer uh, per se. So, uh, you know, as far as heavy metals go, uh, pesticides go, you know, mycotoxins go, I think those are important things that that the consumer needs to be uh, aware of or be um, sh right, be um, protected from. Uh, but terpenes are an added a value added thing. And, and uh, I can see that in the future as being something that Vermont would have a, a pretty good uh, market for as far as specialized, um, you know, hemp products or, or cannabis products with uh, the um, entourage effect with terpenes. Um, so that wouldn't be necessary. You wouldn't necessarily have to do that. Uh, but as far as running uh, the cannabinoids, we have a panel and they all come out. So we differentiating THC from alpha THC to delta THC to CBD, CBG uh, wouldn't be uh, productive because it all it, it it requires the same amount of time and comes out at the same time with the instrument. You get that all as an added effect of running that assay. So uh, differentiating them wouldn't help as far as if I just want to see THC and Delta 9 uh, and CBD that we couldn't separate out and say, oh, that's that's what you get. We could, but it wouldn't make any difference because we have the other um, uh, derivatives in there as well. In your report, yeah, uh, I appreciate that. And I, I remember you had we had discussed this 
previously, but you know, as we're thinking, as Pepper alluded to, we're thinking of ways to get creative here. Always tough mind. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly, but I'm probably the amount, the number of times tested could be worthwhile. The finished product would be most important because that's what the consumer will see. Um, you know, upstream testing, screening, uh, maybe there's a cheaper way of doing that. Uh, but the finished product, I think, would always have to be uh, tested for these specific analytes. At least that's my thinking. <clears throat> but you wouldn't have to test everything, your whole crop, because then you wouldn't have anything to sell, of course. So you have to get proper examples. Another thing that could be done is send a consultant. Uh, let's say, say we could hire a consultant from BIA to go out to the farmers and give them, you know, ideas on how, how to sample a crop, how to, uh, you know, what would be necessary to fulfill the requirements for the state. And, um, and that would be something that they could possibly do or do actually do the sampling for the farmer and bring it back to BIA. Uh, that's a possibility. I, you know, just just thinking off uh, top of my head. Um, I don't need to. No, go ahead. The only other thought I have here um, is that what we've done for some people that don't want to spend um, the large amount of money on a full panel initially is they submit their sample enough to run a full panel, but we'll just run cannabinoids for them first. Um, that way they can see if they're compliant or um, they can see where their levels are falling, where they want them to or not. And then they'll, we'll be able to be contacted by them and continue on with any further testing that they want. Um, so it kind of, it doesn't strap them into a full panel initially, um, but it allows, we're allowing them the, the opportunity to eventually test that sample. The other thing that can be done as we do in the lab here uh, for the allergens uh, is we can uh, composite samples. So let's say a farmer has, you know, um, several things that he wants to test, uh, but uh, we can probably, because the sensitivity of our methods are so high, so, so sensitive that we could probably test several composites together, homogenize it, and run it as a single sample, and that would give us a good overview, as long as nothing popped up too high, uh, of the contaminants that would save the farmer a considerable amount of money compositing. There would be a, an, an added cost to composite, you know, an extra 20 30 $40 or whatever, but it would defray the total cost of, let's say, testing four samples at $195 you know, that's $800 if this way they only, would only charge, you know, $210 or something like that. So that'd be one way to defray their cost. Thank you. You think that's a possibility? Yeah. Slender, yeah. Tom, uh, BIA is, you know, pretty well established. You've got your ISO, um, but for someone someone else that wants to get into the testing, wants to seek a testing license. Um, you know, we have to think about when to issue these licenses, how we sequence that in relation to cultivator, issuing cultivator licenses, product manufacturer licenses, and retail licenses. Um, for someone else, other than you, because you already have your ISO certification, and you already have your building, and, you know, when should we license, like, when in the process should we be licensing uh, the testing facilities? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it would be helpful to have the requirement for licensing earlier, you know, definitely give people a heads up because it'll take labs a while, obviously, to get the data together, um, you know, to obtain the license. So I don't know if that kind of depends on what you consider starting the licensing process, but certainly we'd hope for the, you know, the requirements and the parameters you were looking for. And that would help out the smaller labs, like with the, the hemp program, they don't necessarily require the ISO certification, but they essentially have the same, you know, the same requirements for method validation and documentation. So that can certainly save smaller labs money because they don't have to go through ISO and spend the whatever $20,000, you know, initially getting set up there. Well, that, yeah, <laughs> but they, uh, they have to do, you know, the same amount of analysis and documentation ultimately, which takes time. So that that aspect, at least, I would get out. Knowing the requirements. Knowing the requirements, you know, I would 
want to see as soon as possible, not just for us, but especially for someone that mm -hmm. is starting from ground zero or. But yeah, I'm not sure, you know, if it makes that much difference to the process, the whole process from a high level looking down, um, you know, what, you know, of course the lab has to be there, the lab <clears throat> for the farmer to know that his crop is safe uh, and the processor also has to know. So I would think um, that maybe, yeah, that um, licensing and um, understanding what the requirements are would be uh, a prerequisite uh, for um, this process. Is that fifteen hundred dollar fee? Is that that you pay for the hemp um, testing facility? I mean, does that seem reasonable to you as a business owner? I mean, that's for your business person. Oh yeah, fifteen hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Compared to what? Yeah, <laughs> ISO charges. Yes, <laughs> that's very reasonable. Okay. Yeah. What was the decision to go with ISO? Is that just the gold standard? The decision to go with ISO versus another third party certification? Well, so I should I should uh, differentiate here. We're ex we're certified to the ISO 17025 standard, which is the standard for all analytical labs. But we're accredited through A2LA, which is a certification body. So you can choose Harry Johnson or ALAC or uh, A2LA. We went with A2LA because they have a really good reputation. Yeah, and you know, they 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 attend the same AOAC meetings. We attend the same conferences meetings present at those conferences. So we have really very uh, good knowledge of them and, and know that they're they're a well respected organization. Uh, yeah. And they're they're very heavily involved in in the cannabis industry. Um, I don't know so much about the other uh, accreditation bodies, but HLA is very involved in cannabis regulations and testing. Yeah. So but ISO we are ISO certified for the um, allergen lab. And you know, in order for uh, to compete in the market, uh, in the larger market, the food market, you really should have to be, you should be ISO certified uh, for that market. So that's why uh, we went with ISO. And plus we have all the nuts and bolts in place for ISO. Uh, we have a person dedicated for quality control here, who, and that's all he does, or not all he does, but mo a lot of what he does, is looking at our ISO certification and making sure our quality control is where it's supposed to be. So for him to step in and help with the uh, hemp and cannabis uh, certification was was paramount and really made things happen very quickly for us. That's great. Any other questions for the VIA team? I'm good at the moment. All set, thank you. Well, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you and your team, um, and thank you for the services that you provide for Vermont and the hemp program. And congratulations on the acquisition of the IP for the, the testing that we came up with. Um, that's pretty exciting that a Vermont company um, did that. Um, you know, when we were visiting the lab, you also had a great COVID story. I feel like you guys adapted very quickly and were able to accommodate a lot of your um, employees' needs, and it, it's just another great success story. Um, and, um, but thank you for being here. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we were very lucky with the uh, last year with the uh, uh, when the pandemic struck that we were able to take uh, half our employees offline for a week and uh, keep the other half here for working. It was probably a strain on, on our employees for that one week, but they were off the next week, so that helped a lot. And nobody lost salary, nobody lost any benefits, and that was really helpful to them and to us as well, of course, and to our, uh, our clients, our, our uh, customers. So yeah. uh, it was a win-win for everybody, and uh, we definitely want to keep everybody safe. Luke and uh, Adam just came back from a conference in Phoenix, and since they just came back, they're having to wear a mask here, so we want to keep everybody safe. Uh, Carly has an underlying condition that she has to wear a mask, and uh, but we're all fully vaccinated, at least all three of us, and um, so uh, we're just doing what we have to do to, to make sure that uh, everybody's safe and we can still do what we have to do. Thank you.
This is so great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be in touch um, as we kind of move through some of these regulations around testing um, for, your, for your advice and your help. If there's anything else we can do, please don't hesitate to ask. We're glad to help. And, um, you know, whatever it is, thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule. I don't think our next witness can join before 2, so I'd like to do just a 15-minute break if everyone's okay with that. Dan, are you with us? Dan, you can hit uh, star six to unmute yourself, sorry. Are you there? Can you, can you hear me? Better? Yeah, now we can hear you. Um, so we're back from the camera. Uh, sorry, what was that? I just said there's a bit of an echo, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, well, let us know if it, it is, you know, you're unable to proceed. Um, but Dan uh, Chang, you're the co-founder of Korea Botanicals. Um, you know, you're a product manufacturer in the hemp world. Uh, I, we just would love to hear from you about kind of what's involved with Korea, what, what you guys do, and, um, you know, maybe just some of the challenges that you see as, as we transition as a state into an adult use recreational market and maybe some of the opportunities that there might be for product manufacturers and, and I don't know if there's anything specific about the law that you want to talk about or, or any kind of just pitfalls that we might be headed towards as a regulatory agency um, that you want us to be that you want on our radar as kind of a product manufacturer in the hemp world. Sure. I'm happy to, and I'll, I'll apologize in advance if I have any poor reception or cutouts. I'm calling you from the beautiful Vermont State Park, so um, a bit of a tough one. But so yeah, Pepper's right. I am uh, one of the co-founders of Korea Botanicals. We are in South Burlington. Uh, we're about four years old now, and we started out. Um, in the hemp economy right when uh, legalization failed last time in the legislature. So we decided to pivot and learn what we could about CBD because it would seem to us to be the perfect analog if we someday wanted to get into a recreational marijuana market uh, to learn about the extraction, the growing, the analytics of the plant. Um, and CBD seemed like a logical place to do that. So. To that end, uh, about four years ago, we started growing hemp. Um, I grew for two years. Uh, what we learned was that I didn't need to keep growing. Uh, there would be plenty of farmers getting into hemp, and boy, was that correct. Um, and the other thing was that we, what Vermont really needed was not more growers at the time, but they needed... Um, analytics to legitimize the industry and then they also needed extraction capacity in the state because all of that hemp needed to have the value add somehow to get to a finished product and extraction is where that happens so we spent the next couple of years learning about analytics and extraction and we finally opened up providing certified organic, uh, really high-end boutique oils to the CBD market um, and providing analytics as well, limited analytics. So we opened up a small lab, kind of a proof of concept lab, and we were doing uh, an extraction with supercritical carbon dioxide, uh, which, which produces a very, very pure extract, a very, very high quality, what's called a crude oil in the business. And that crude oil can then be further, well, it can be formulated with, but it can also be further refined into more potent uh, concentrates like distillate and isolate and all sorts of consumer concentrates. Um, but it all starts with the plant and the crude oil and then the, the analytics uh, to make sure that you've got a clean product. Um, so the full panel of analytics, of course, would 
include potency, the percentage of the cannabinoids you're looking for, your target cannabinoids, whether they're CBD or THC or now CBG. Um, or then you move on to look at the purity of your oil in terms of do you have heavy metals from the soil? Do you have residual solvents from your extraction if you use things like ethanol to extract rather than carbon dioxide? Are there pesticides, residual pesticides um, from your farming or from your neighbor's farm? So all of these things go into the analytical suite that, that tells you if your, your crude oil is clean. Um, and so that's what we did to start. And it was a very, very niche market providing this high-end oil. And our throughput was very small with the CO2 extraction because we were only able to do about 10 pounds in extraction, so maybe 30, 40 pounds a day at max. Um, so we decided to add on another extraction methodology, which is ethanol. Now, ethanol also makes a, a high-quality crude oil, but not quite as high-quality as, as CO2. Uh, there is residual solvent that needs to be taken care of, um, and it can be further purified into all sorts of things as well. But the benefit of the ethanol extraction is that you have a much, much, much higher throughput. So I'm doing hundreds of pounds a day instead of 20, 30, 40 pounds a day all of a sudden. So our lab now, uh, we built a new lab uh, in 2020, unfortunately, in South Burlington, and we added ethanol extraction. So it's not unique, but it is very rare for a CBD extraction lab to have two methodologies. Uh, usually you build a lab around one, whether it's CO2 or ethanol. Uh, and we do both, and we do analytics. Um, and we were the state's and the Northeast's first, New England's first certified USDA organic lab. Uh, we're also certified kosher. So we're going after all of these audits and third-party certifications to try to seem legitimate um, in, the lack, in the lack of ratified uh, state or federal CBD laws. Um, so that's the world that I've been existing in up until now, um, working with the fire marshals in south burlington to build our new lab was quite a process that was a new thing to them so we jumped through every hoop with third-party audits and engineering audits and i think they were very grateful to have the experience and i was very grateful to be uh, audited by the state and, and kind of be in the good graces with the fire department so that's that's kind of where we stand now and i think i'll shift to to talk about a little bit about the upcoming rec market and, and where extractors like myself might find themselves um, and some of the pros and cons of, of how I see it. Um, one of the main things that's important to realize for us is that extraction labs and analytical labs have an extremely high barrier to entry. Um, because of the instrumentation that's involved, the machines are very expensive. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, usually. Um, now that I've gone through all of the fire audits, I know that that part of it, getting all of the engineering audits and the correct machinery, adds tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, many extraction labs uh, run clandestinely outside of the purview of, of anybody because the laws are so lax right now. But when you want to run completely approved by the state and by engineers, it's a lot more expensive. So having a visible, legitimate lab is, is quite expensive to do. And this, it's all the same on the analytics side. The instrumentation is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Um, also, the people that you hire, the personnel, uh, these are trained chemists that we work with. Um, these are not $15, $17 an hour jobs, although I do have some of those employees on my bottling line and in packaging. I really have to hire employees that understand chemistry and botany and things like that. So I've got salaried employees and they're all paid very well. So that's another barrier to entry. Um, now, when I'm considering joining the Vermont rec marijuana market, um, there's a number of things that are issues that I have to consider. Um, number one is it was allowed to happen somehow that the current, uh, permit holders are out of state, sometimes multinational public companies um, with more money than Croesus, right? So 
here I am, a, a small Vermont entrepreneur, um, and I have to decide whether or not I can compete with these kind of competitors. Now, not only are they large, they've got a lot of money. They may have up to 10 years operating in the space in other states or other countries. Um, they're going to have vertical licenses, which means that their margins are going to be astronomically better than mine and that their market share will be much bigger than I will ever be. Um, also, if they get a head start of an indeterminate amount of time, months, six months, a year, three months, I don't, I don't know what that time is going to be, but I would then come into the market facing these giants with all of this money and experience, and they have 100% of the market share already. So that's a very daunting market for a company, a Vermont entrepreneur like myself, to face. Uh, I've been in the market now for four years working towards this moment when I might be able to apply for an extraction permit. Um, but I really, I'm, I'm an established business in the CBD market now, and that's got its own ups and downs. And I've really got to take a hard look at whether this market is even accessible uh, to a company <laughs> like mine. And and I'm actually head and shoulders above most entrepreneurs because I've already got the equipment and I've got four years of experience and I've got people trained on using it and SOPs. I've, I've already got a lot that most people don't have. And yet uh, I'm on still way, 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 way behind uh, the people that will already be there. So that's a major consideration of mine. Um, another one would be probably growing. Um, you know, I'm sure you've heard of other states that have had nightmares of opening up their wreck and having too little supply of flour and then maybe too oversupply of flour. That happened out west a lot. Um, they didn't establish their grows correctly, so that was an issue. Um, so, you know, as a hemp supplier, I like to get as much quality product as I can from one farmer, which would speak to having very large grows. Having small, lots of little farmers, um, that's difficult for me records-wise. It's difficult for me in terms of quality, and it's expensive analytics-wise. But if I have the same hemp that's consistent from one farmer that knows how to grow it and dry it, I much prefer that as a CBD extractor. Now, in the rec marijuana market, I think it's a little bit different. There is a variety that people want, so... I think that having large growths that can fill the pipeline are essential, but also having local smaller growths that can um, provide the quality um, would be also necessary. Sorry, I'm being asked to move my car <laughs> by the park ranger. Um, so there are, there are a number of considerations uh, in growing the hemp as well. Um, the, as an extractor, I am really interested in. I want to make sure you, everybody can still hear me. Am I still coming through? Yeah, okay? you're coming in. Yeah, yeah, we hear you, Dan. Okay. I'm just going to move my car a little bit so this ranger gets off my back. If that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making which any part, friends. Which park are you in? Uh, I am in Little River. I'm only in Waterbury. I'm up at the reservoir. Okay. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Beautiful day. Um, so, you know, I was, I was kind of talking. Yeah, great fishing. I've been eating rainbow trout for breakfast this morning that we just caught. So I've been speaking a little bit about some of the concerns that, that are at top of mind, I know, for me and my partners. Number one being, is the market accessible even? Um, I know that it's, it's already a done deal with who holds the licenses, but I do believe there's probably still some wiggle room in how the, the market is created and how, those, how they're allowed to operate in terms of, I don't know if it's verticality or in terms of lead time that they're allowed to have, but I would urge the, the people or the board to consider uh, Vermont businesses and smaller Vermont businesses uh, when you're looking at this, because um, it's going to be a, a major uphill climb for us to enter this market. Um, and I'm speaking just as an extractor. Uh, I assume for analytics, 
uh, for growing and for retail, it'll, it'll all be similar stories. Um, beyond that, the big picture, uh, growing, uh, making sure that there is enough in the marketplace to get the market going, but also enough uh, so that small Vermont growers can have a place as well um, and can contribute their knowledge, expertise, and quality to this as well. In the hemp market, there's a, in the hemp reg, regulation market, there's this uh, Vermont products that have to be grown in Vermont by Vermont farmers and certified in Vermont. And I don't know if something like that would work in the rec market as well, um, but it's something to think about. Um, I'm happy to field any questions that anybody there has for me as well. Dan, I have a question. This is Kyle Harris. It's a it's a pleasure to meet you via via phone. I hope to meet you in person sometime in the near future. Um, I look forward to it. Yeah, I look forward to it. In, a, in our authorizing legislation, there's a there's a 60% cap on concentrates, and I was hoping you might be able to speak to your perspectives on that and um, how that potentially could also be a barrier. Um, for you and your business to enter this market, we've we've heard um, from others that it could potentially be, but would but would love to get your thoughts. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Kyle. It slipped my mind, and it's actually huge. Um, so I mentioned earlier how we extract the, the raw biomass plant material into a crude oil, and that crude oil then gets refined into any number of concentrates that can go into products or can be consumed as is in the marijuana world or I'm sorry in the rec world you see things like shatter and hash and all these crazy things that are made um, they're all all of the concentrates which are a massive massive part of the market I don't I don't have a number of the market share of concentrates in my mind but um, they're all about 60 percent as far as I know the crude oil that comes out of my extractors is usually 60 to low 80s percent now that's the crude oil when I refine it further, it's 80% in 80% purity into the 90% purity. Um, that's and and there is a, there are myriad concentrates that are used in the rec market, um, and all of those would pretty much be taken off of the shelf. So you'd be looking at things like flour, um, gummy bears, and edibles and things like that. But a lot of the concentrates that people really enjoy. Um, would not be a part of the market. So that is, that, you know, if that's a rule that, that should just get dropped, in my opinion. Um, that's, that's something that's going to put a major hamper on um, the extraction and the, well, the extraction, as long as we, as long as we dilute the product down to whatever legal amount, like you said, if it was 60%, then we could still participate. But we would never be able to participate nationally. We were, we'd be watering down the quality and diluting the quality of the product um, to make it Vermont legal, and then nobody else would want it in New York or Boston or anywhere, really. Um, so we'd be kneecapping ourselves as a state by doing that, in my opinion. Um, so uh, if there are any question, further questions about that, I can speak to it. <clears throat> Oh, oh, I have a further question about that. I just, you know, because we talk about concentrates being in, like you were saying, 80, 90% purest form. What, can you talk about what it would be diluted with to get it to 60%? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that people would be making a lot of edibles. So they'd be putting it into a lot of ingestible foods. But if you're talking about, I don't even know. Like in the CBD world, we have to do this. And we use things like uh, MCT oil, uh, coconut oil, to make tinctures and things like that. We dilute it to a legal limit, which then allows us to ship it federally. It allows people to formulate with it. Um, but the CBD stuff is not, it's a different market because those are all smaller dosages. In the marijuana market, granted, there are smaller dosage edibles, but a lot of the concentrate market is on purity and it's on high potency. So all of those products, like I said, would be kneecapped by something like this. Um, I, I can't answer directly what you would mix it with. Uh, maybe lower, maybe a lower um, potency oil. So, you know, it, it knocks it down. But again, you're really just compromising the quality um, by doing it. And 
you know, some people might say, well, why do you need something to be 80, 90 percent pure? And of course you don't. You just don't. Um, but that's the market. I mean, that's there is a concentrates market. It's a diverse market. It's a sizable market. It's based on quality. Um, so, you know, the market exists. And again, if we were wanted to compete nationally, this would be a pretty major issue. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, your, your response to not necessarily knowing how you would approach the dilution part of that gives me pause because uh, as we've heard from prior testimony, you know, Vermont folks are, are they have that, that genius, what, what was it, In, ingenuity, ingenuity. ingenuity, and they'll, they'll figure out how to do it, but from a consumer protection perspective, from a quality perspective, mm -hmm. what does that mean, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, how would the board go about ensuring acceptable practices for diluting it back down to that 60%? And, and Dan, can I pick up yeah. on something that you said, which was, I think you said that a lot of this extraction is happening in people's garages in the kind of clandestine market um, already. So does this just leave a yeah. kind of, does that leave that kind of clandestine market vibrant as well? I mean, is that? Oh, of course. Yeah. Of, of course. I mean, the black market will, will always be there. Uh, you know, you, you want to knock it as small as you can or get rid of it. Uh, but um the fact is the quality is, is there in the black market. The growers in the black market are better than any medicinal grower, um, than, any, than any medicinal lab that, that exists. And these, you can make these in your garage. Um, so people will. They, they have been for decades, and they, they will continue. So, yeah, they, again, um, it will exist. It's just a matter of do you want to regulate it or, or not. Um, I, I would think you do. Another one, that, kind of a sidebar to this, um, that you should think about is in the hemp world, and I don't know about the proposed rec laws. I haven't read them in enough detail, but we're not allowed to use, in the hemp world, we're not allowed to use hydrocarbons here in Vermont, meaning uh, propane, hexane, pentane. These are all hydrocarbons that are very, very commonly used to extract cannabis, and they, they produce extremely high quality extracts. Um, but they are very toxic, caustic chemicals, and if not used in a regulated and safe manner, uh, extremely dangerous. And also, if, they're, if their extracts are not properly tested, um, you don't know if there's residual solvents in it, which is dangerous. And that's the problem with these clandestine labs um, that you brought up, is that many, many, many labs in the CBD world um, are clandestine because there, there weren't certifying bodies when I, when we started there were no fire marshals going out um department of health and ag wasn't going out to look at any labs so that's why we started doing things like organic and kosher just so we would start to get audited um so you know a lot of people are doing this stuff in their basements and they're not purging their oils of these solvents um so that's why i think that it's smart to give it space in the rec market but regulate it but make sure that the rules are there and the specs are there and the analytics are in place to ensure safe products because people will be making them either way. Um, yeah. And as an extractor, I've never touched this stuff because I haven't been allowed to. And that's why I don't, I don't really know how to dilute this or I, I really don't know um, how we would manage a 60% purity thing just yet. Um, I've got a question on a different topic. Anyone want to talk about concentrates anymore? No. Good. Um, Dan, uh, we uh, by statute are supposed to um, prioritize uh, and break down barriers for small cultivators, um, but I want to pick up on something that, that you mentioned. Um, you need a consistent product, uh, the raw materials, uh, to be consistent, of consistent quality. So how do we thread that needle? Are you just not going to, I mean, should we just rely on the small cultivators for um, for flour and not the kind of processed products or the extracted products? Or, I mean, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Like uh, how we can build out our craft cultivation using small farmers, but also create these kind of products, these extractions? Yeah, it's a tough one. You know, there has to be some kind of cleared system, I would imagine, where you've got you know, your Vermont small cultivators. Um, and this is tricky because I think that's where your best quality is going to come from. But that's also where 
probably most of your not I won't say worst qualities, but potential glitches will come from too. Um, you're going to have really conscientious, excellent growers, but then there's going to be a couple people who are smaller and they're just they just don't have the technology and the place set up to grow quality, safe flower, which is it's not easy to do it over and over. It's easy to do it once, but it's not easy to do it over and over and over again at scale and maintain spec. Um, so it has to be kind of the balance where you let people in that know what they're doing and are competent at it while making sure that you weed out the yahoos that just want to grow marijuana and think that it's a fun thing to do. There will always be those people who know weed themselves out to a certain extent, but you do, you do need to have the size of the more sizable grows just to keep the pipeline full as well. I don't know how many dispensaries you envision are going to be open or how much flour you envision is going to be sold over a you know, quarter over quarter annually uh, year over year, but um, the small growers probably aren't going to be able to keep up with that in any consistent fashion. Um, so there needs to be a pipeline, a base that fills the pipeline as well. Um, and I, I see that coming from these big, let these big guys do what they do best, these big operations. Um, they've got the money. They've already got big grows in Canada and all over the country. They know exactly how to do it. And they've got the growers to come do it. Um, and let the smaller growers shoot for quality. Um, and, I, you know, beyond that, I, I'm, I don't have a heck of a lot of advice. There obviously has to be some middle ground as well. But um, in terms of how many permits, uh, that that I'll leave up to you. I don't know. Yeah. But um, it is important, like I said, to make sure you've got consistent quality product. Uh, you know. Also, I should mention, I don't know how uh, this is all going to get timed out if these if um, if uh, you know, analytics and growing and retail are going to be phased in, you know, in quarters or if they all get released at once. But, um, you know, obviously extractors, as an extractor, we can't extract without the hemp flower and the retail can't open without the flower and the extracts. And we all need analytics. So everything has to be layered and kind of going at the same time so we can all open at the same time as well. Um, timing of these permit releases is also really, really critical. Yeah, and I, I was actually just going to ask you about that. I mean, you, I think Korea, unfortunately, was kind of the guinea pig on a lot of the hemp program and the fire safety that you mentioned. Um, but now that we're a little bit more established in the state, uh, how long did, would it take a, you know, Korea, if you were starting today from scratch, to get up to where you are? Um, at this moment? Oh, man. Uh, you know, that's a great question. And it depends on if you're actually starting from scratch where you've got to buy machines and train people how to use them because the learning curve on that, on getting your machines running the way you want them and producing what you want to is, is months. I mean, it took us probably a better part of a year um, to get everything running smoothly the way we wanted it to. Now, if you're a huge multinational company with a lot of money you can bring in experts in machinery and have it running within a couple of weeks if you've already got the people but if you're starting from scratch as a vermont entrepreneur it, 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 it could take it would take a minimum of three to six months to get your machines and your staff up and running um so yeah you would need to have not only the hemp at that time you need to have analytics because I mentioned it briefly, but analytics brings the legitimacy to everything. The growers need it to know how if their plants are, are legal and on spec, and the labs and or the extraction labs need it to know um, if what they're producing is on spec. Most extraction labs do not have analytics in house. Uh, we do just for a matter of QA, QC, and it keeps us moving really well. And it may be the reason why we're still around while some people aren't, but. Um, to run a lab on an analytics lab on top of an extraction lab is, is a lot of learning and a lot of work. So, and it all has to happen together. All 
growing labs analytics and extraction all have to happen simultaneously. Um, and then retail can come in after all that to sell everything that we make. Um, but it can't come in before any of us um, obviously make the stuff. Um, I got another question, but I want to open it up. No, I'm good. All right. Uh, Dan, when do you like to, when do you like to have your product tested when you have the raw material or, you know, tested for heavy, heavy metals, pesticides, adulterants, et cetera, or when you have your, it's a great question. Yeah. It's a great question. So I'll, I'll give you the rundown on the hemp side, how we do it. Um, the farmer is obligated to, to do a full panel of tests on his hemp. So, her hemp. So that lets us know about the potency of the biomass, make sure that it's legal because in the hemp world, that's important, but you can't have too much THC in it. Otherwise it's marijuana and, and then everybody's in trouble. But so there's potency, there is residual, I mean, sorry, there's heavy metal, um, there's pesticides, things like that, moisture. Then it gets into our lab. If all those check out, it comes into our lab. We'll test it again for potency to make sure it matches and is legal to make sure that we can run it. We'll then extract it. And as soon as we have the crude oil, we'll test the crude oil to see the potency. Uh, then we also have to test it mandated by, sorry, mandated by the state. We have to test it to make sure that it doesn't have any more residual solvents or pesticides or anything like that in it. Quiet. Um, so we have to do a whole other full panel. And then after that, uh, we formulate a product out of it. So we'll make it into a tincture or into a salve or a balm or a stick, something like that. And we have to test it again to make sure that it's on spec for the customer. Does it have what the customer wanted in it? And then after that, it goes to a third party lab to be tested again. So, you know, this stuff is tested five, six times as it goes through uh, our lab and out the other end by a third party for the customer. So you can see why analytics um, it's such an important part of this because from the farmer to the customer all through our lab, they'll test the same lot of stuff many, many times. And did that testing, as it's been concentrated down, become more expensive to you? Like, I, you know, when you start with a bunch of raw material and then you extract all the kind of CBD, THC out of it, I mean, did that testing become you know, the, the product itself uh, is more expensive. Um, and so... No, the test testing is all... The testing is all the same. Um, it's the same tests we run through, and they all cost the same no matter what the, what you put into the machine. Um, one thing that's different, I mentioned it briefly earlier, though. If we have a ton of growers, like right now my lab uses three or four growers, so it's all the same hemp, and they're vetted, and we know what they're growing and how they're drying, and that's all happy. But if I'm all of a sudden using 20 different growers of small batches of, pro of, of biomass, then I have to be testing exponentially more. I have to be testing everything, everything. Um, you know, that's, that's daunting for me because to do one full panel, uh, it's, you know, three, four hundred dollars. And I have to do that a couple times on the product as it goes through. So the, the testing is, I mean, it's a very, very large bill for my lab even though we have the potency testing in house, we outsource everything else. So um, it's not to be, it's not to be just brushed aside. Uh, it's, it's a big, big thing to consider um, when, you know, when the testing will be opened up and how many labs, I mean, you really have to have labs available um, and there aren't, well, there's be a diagnostic I'm trying to think who else is in Vermont. You would know more than me. They're the only state certified ish lab I can think of in Vermont is Bia Diagnostic. Um, yeah. So we need, we need more, you know, and these labs, these labs cost millions of dollars to open up um, and, and run, like I said. So this is a, that's a critical thing is in the hemp world, we're supposed to have everything tested by a state certified lab and there are no state certified labs. So, we use labs in Colorado and in Philadelphia and in Boston um, for all of our third party stuff. Um, it's because there aren't any Vermont state certified labs in existence. So that's another thing that you're going to have to find is I'm sure there will be growers. I'm sure somebody will, there'll be plenty of retail applications 
Extraction will be tough because it's so expensive. And the same with labs. It's so expensive to get into. Um, those are the two that are going to be hard to get a lot of entrepreneurs into. Yeah. Well, this has been incredibly helpful to us. I actually have one more question, but it's going to open a big can of worms, so I'm not going to ask it. Uh, but um, thank you, Dan. I mean, it's just, I'm so grateful that you're in Vermont. It's a little distressing to hear that, you know, you're doing this good work, and yet you have hesitancy to get into this market um, because of the barriers to entry. Um, so it's something that we're going to be thinking about a lot, and, you know, hopefully we can be back in touch with you um, in Korea. Uh, as we start. Yeah. To well, I, I really appreciate all of you uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm sorry I'm a little bit distracted by my dog and park rangers and campers, mm -hmm. but I don't know how many people are in the room there, but I obviously would love to show you our lab in person and show you the machines and the extracts and the analytical equipment and explain it to you and have you meet our employees wonderful Vermont employees um, because it's the kind of lab, honestly, it's the kind of lab you, you want in Vermont. Uh, we are Vermonters employing good jobs. We're, we're hiring people from out of state to come move here and live here. Um, and they're having kids here. Uh, this is the kind of thing that's good for Vermont. So it's important that, that, that we are allowed to have a place in this economy because it's a big one. And We've been waiting for it and working towards it. And um, like, like I said, I would love to show you our facilities. So, so please reach back out to, to Bill and to me and, and come into our lab and, and see it for yourself sometime soon. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, we will do that. Thank you. And thanks for taking the time right. while you're out you know, on vacation in the state parks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to do it anytime. It's important. Great. All right. Thanks, man. Yep. Adios. So um, that's our last witness for the day. We have some time set aside for public comment. Um, we'll follow the same procedure. We'll start with the folks that have joined through the link. Um, if you have a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. And um, we'll start with um, Ito. Ebo. Ebo. Good afternoon, you guys. Uh, just want to say thanks a lot for the work you're doing. And um, it was great hearing Dan, you know, talk about concentrates and whatnot. I just wanted to kind of echo what he was saying about the 60% THC caps. Um, it, it's going to be really hard to make quality concentrates that can compete on a national level, uh, you know, limiting to 60%. And to go to the things like what we might cut them with are probably things that I don't want to consume and put in my body. I mean, you can use like extra terpenes, like he said, the MCT oil, but it's just, you know, a lot of people want to smoke those things because they're not inhaling any plant material. So it's actually a bit healthier for your body, um, myself included. And, you know, I just really want Vermont to be able to compete in that category like we do in every other craft category, you know, being like kind of the best in show. And then I know that you had a question that he couldn't answer and concentrates take up about 13 percent of the market you know, is, is what in sales. And that's from like the BDS analytics from California. So I'm assuming it's going to be fairly similar. Hey, thanks for that. Thanks for that. That's how it's true. That's where the net generates to generate too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Eric Reed, if you want to unmute yourself. All right, can you guys hear me? Uh, we can barely hear you. Uh, we can hear you, yeah. Hello? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Give me just a second, if you may. I'm going to shut my Bluetooth off. That might be the culprit. Because I do have some. Um, Any better now? Floor? Oh yeah, there you are. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. All right. So on the 60%, I've been making some notes here, so I may um, I may say some things that have been said. On the 60%, um, what you're doing is you're making everybody uh, have to add a cutter, have to add carrier oils, 
uh, was just mentioned, we don't want to inhale that. We don't want to consume that. So you're going to take all the, 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 the dabbing and all the vape uh, completely out of the market. And uh, the, the difference from the 60 uh, up to, um, you're going to have to cut because at the base, uh, I can go up to 75, 6% myself. A lab can take that up to 82.3 with better filtration. And then you can run that through a short path to get that into the 90s. Then this is what I don't like medically is then they take that into a reactor and and take everything out. So there's um, there's no more regulators uh, medically. Um, so uh, what you're the, the difference between the 60 and the 90 is is how, how the fats, the lipids, uh, what would be called in the vaping and dabbing world, the undesirables. So we don't want to combust. Uh, any more uh, fats, any more waxes than we have to. And by making us go to 60, you're going to make us artificially add some. And nobody wants to vape uh, or dab any of that, and they won't. And so you're going to uh, uh, you're going to increase some illegal activity. Plus, you're going to make it dangerous because butane, which it's illegal, it's in the bill, and it should not be used because of the flash points so low, um, it leaves all those uh, undesirables behind it only picks up terpenes and cannabinoids so if you're making crap in the market and i can take butane and make real high quality uh terpene rich uh you know dabble material now the problem is the solvents um i would personally i would look at uh the solvents that are left in the product like test 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 on solvents um and then personally i would say no hundred percent uh, I want a regulator. I don't want that thing to be uh, just THC because we don't know. And there could be long-term use. There could be problems with just THC only. Um, that's my personal view. So uh, that's that's what I had for you on that 60%. And um, I think the way that you you go about that is you test on the solvents, and then you test on 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 any of the on anything else that's left behind that somebody would know more than me about. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next on the list is uh, Sherman. Sherman Horn. Sherman, if you're there, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and um, join by video if you'd like. Let's see. Here I am. Uh, thanks for letting um, me share. Um, I would like to make a comment on required microbial contaminant testing, if that's okay. We're having a little trouble um, hearing you. Um, we're having a little trouble I, I might be having a... Um, better that actually sounds better for us. Okay, um, so... Is it okay if I make a comment about required microbial contaminant testing? Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm presently the director of regulatory affairs at Medicinal Genomics, but previously at the New Jersey Public Health Lab. Uh, I was the project manager that started the cannabis testing lab uh, for Department of Health, and I was the subject matter expert specifically for required microbial testing um, and that I wanted to share that medicinal genomics is an industry leader in cannabis and pathogen genomics. And I was going through the internet this morning before this meeting and I noted that presently Vermont requires the microbial tests as was mentioned by the laboratory representatives earlier this afternoon, uh, total aerobic microbial count and total yeast and mold. Uh, on the other hand, and I'll, I'll be, you know, sending in a written comment on this, you know, we recommend the microbial testing specifications that were originally recommended by the Fido Science Institute um, submitted in 2016 to the Vermont Medical Cannabis Program because we want to ensure safe product for both patients as well as consumers. And the, the tests that Phytoscience Institute recommended were the species-specific 
human pathogens, which are the shigatoxin-producing E. coli, the Salmonella species, and the three pathogenic strains of Aspergillus. And, and, and the most important fact I want to just share with you, the two tests that you require right now in the medical cannabis program, when you get a result, for total aerobic and total yeast and mold, you don't get any information whether the cannabis sample is contaminated with any dangerous microbes to human health. So I'm just going to say, why do these tests? And so I just wanted to share that, um, but I'll be sending him a formal comment in the near future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Can you also just include your contact information when you do that? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll definitely do that. Um, okay, anyone else uh, that would like to make a public comment um, that joined through the link, please just raise your virtual hand. Um, and uh, it looks like we have one person who's joined via the phone. If you would like to make a public comment, please hit star six to unmute yourself. And we have one person in the audience. I would just echo the voice of uh, uh, that's already been said about uh, the opposition to potency caps for a number of reasons already mentioned. Just another the opposition. Okay, I don't see anyone else um, for public comment, so uh, that's the last thing on our agenda. I, uh, again, we'll probably be meeting again next Thursday. Hopefully, uh, we can meet at 116 State Street in Montpelier. Um, and we'll probably be most likely talking about public safety issues and safe banking issues. So um, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.